Eastern, 5.30 Pacific. Here's tonight's program lineup. Ahead, today's House campaign fundraising investigation hearing. Then in four hours and 20 minutes, the Senate Judiciary Committee looks at the nomination of Bill Lan Lee to be Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights. After that, the dedication ceremony for the George Bush Presidential Library and Museum. Participants include former Presidents Bush, Carter, and Ford, as well as President Clinton. Now we take you to Capitol Hill for a House Government Reform and Oversight Committee hearing on campaign fundraising. Today, committee members heard from Counsel to the President Charles Ruff and Special Counsel to the President Lanny Brewer. Today's witnesses talked about the White House's compliance with committee subpoenas and record requests. Congressman Dan Burton chaired this four-hour hearing. we uh, uh, discuss uh, business with our guests here this morning will be the minority consultant contract. Without objection, the contract will be considered as read. The gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, is recognized in support of this contract. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The um, minority is proposing that the committee approve a consultant contract with the Emerald Group. The Emerald Group is an international security management firm that provides investigative services to corporations, institutions, and individuals. The minority proposes this contract because the minority seeks the assistance of the Emerald Group in investigating possible conduit payments to the Republican National Committee and the Dole campaign. These conduit payments are the same activity that the committee is investigating, except the recipients are Republicans, not Democrats. Approval of this contract should be routine. In June, the majority and the minority discussed how consultants would be handled. We propose that consultants hired by our committee be a joint resource, which means that both sides would be informed about the work of the consultants. Chairman Burton's staff rejected this idea. They insisted that they wanted uh, their complete control over the activities of the consultants hired by the majority. As a result, what we agreed to is they get 75% of the money that would be used for consultants, and we would get 25% uh, to allocate as each of us sees fit, and those consultants would work for each of us. Since June, uh, the majority has hired four consultants. Three of these consultants, including a private investigator and a former CIA operations officer, were hired with our votes. We supported the idea of uh, uh, those consultants being hired uh, because it was the choice of the minority. Today, we're making our first request for a consultant. We had expected this would be routinely approved, just like the majority approved all of its requests for consultants. Unfortunately, it now appears that the majority will deny the minority any consultants. This is simply unfair. It seems that every chance the majority gets, the majority tries to tilt the deck in their favor by denying rights of the minority. Now, the majority is opposing the Emerald Group contract because it, they say it does not prevent conflicts of interest. The fact of the matter is the Emerald Group has agreed to follow exactly the same precautions and procedures that Mr. Bennett agreed to follow as explained in a September 23 letter to myself, the Emerald Group has pledged to follow the House Code of Official Conduct and the House Gift Ban, just as Mr. Bennett did. The Emerald Group has also agreed to conduct a careful review before accepting any assignments to ensure that there is no conflict of interest, exactly the same procedure that Mr. Bennett is following. Specifically, the Emerald Group wrote, quote, for each specific assignment, provided Emerald, Emerald will perform a thorough check using the firm's computer technology 
to ensure that there is no conflict of interest with respect to its existing client list, and if there is a conflict, Emerald will not accept the assignment, end quote. What we're seeing is a double standard being applied by the majority, and it becomes especially apparent when you compare the Emerald Group contract with the first three majority consultants. The majority approved these consultants without requiring any safeguards against conflicts of interest. These consultants are directly comparable to the Emerald Group because like the Emerald Group, they are being used for discrete projects. The Republicans also argue that the consultant contract with the Emerald Group is flawed because it is an entire organization, not a single individual. According to, the, to us, though, this makes it uh, harder to ensure, according to them, it makes it harder to ensure there are no conflicts or other problems. I, I would submit this argument as a straw man. There's no rule against hiring organizations as consultants. In fact, the use of organizations as consultants is expressly authorized by law. Uh, the uh, 2 U.S.C. Section 72A provides each standing committee of the House of Representatives authorized to procure the temporary services of individual consultants or organizations thereof. There's nothing unusual at all about having a consultant contract with a firm instead of a single individual. For example, this is exactly what the Republican majority on the House Oversight Committee has done in the Sanchez-Dornan investigation. On January 8th of this year, the majority entered into a contract for the services of the Baker Hostetler Law Firm. This contract did not limit the number of Baker and Hostler, Hostler attorneys working under the contract. In fact, it specifically provided that the rate of compensation could not exceed $300 per day per attorney providing services. Well, there are a lot of precedents. For example, in the Gingrich investigation by the House Ethics Committee, the consultant contract was not with Jim Cole individually, but with the Brian K. Law Firm. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman and, and my colleagues, we are making this request. We think it's a respectable uh, request, given the rules that we've set out and the way we've operated. Uh, I expect that we're going to lose this. I expect that the Republicans are going to exercise their majority and vote it down. But if they do, it's another example of how the Republican majority of the committee is closing out the rights of the minority to do our investigation, to participate in the uh, campaign financing uh, 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 investigation of the committee overall, and how this is a, an investigation run by a Republican majority uh, to the exclusion of the Democratic minority for purposes that I believe are partisan uh, because they are solely in the interest of the Republican majority rather than the interests of this country for an honest campaign finance investigation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Waxman. Uh, I must uh, regretfully oppose the contract that Congressman Waxman has proposed today. I was hoping that we could reach an agreement on this matter. I've offered to work with him to restructure this contract in a form that would be acceptable to the entire committee but it's apparently not going to be possible. We reached an agreement earlier this year to give the minority 25% of the consultant budget, while the majority would control 75% of the budget. I served in the minority for 12 years, and this is a better deal than we were ever offered on any committee that I ever served on. After reaching this agreement earlier this year, I was very disappointed that the minority decided to vote in lockstep against Dick Bennett's contract. Dick's contract was identical to contracts used by the House Oversight Committee and the House Ethics Committee under both Democrats and Republicans to hire attorneys for sensitive investigations. It should have been routine, and yet they voted in lockstep against him. Unfortunately, we were forced to approve it on a party line vote. Despite this, I am still willing to work with the gentleman from California to resolve some of the problems with this contract. I would like to suggest once again to the gentleman that he withdraw it and work with me to solve some of these problems. The problems are fairly basic. First, this committee has never before contracted with a firm of private investigators to work on an investigation such as this. All of the majority's consultants have been individuals, not entire companies or investigative agencies. The Emerald Group is an international firm. It has offices and major corporate clients all over the world. This is an investigation of influence buying by foreign companies, foreign individuals, and possibly foreign governments. 
The prospects for serious conflicts of interest are too large when you deal with an entire firm like this. The Emerald Group's brochure itself states that they never reveal the identities of their clients. And that is why it is far more appropriate to hire an individual to come in and work out of the committee offices alongside the regular committee staff like Mr. Bennett has. When Dick Bennett came to work as chief counsel, he set up a firewall between his law firm and his work here on this committee. Nobody else from his firm works on this investigation. No resources of his law firm are utilized. This makes it very easy to isolate the potential for any conflicts. I have invited Mr. Waxman to structure this contract in the same way. I have urged him to put together a contract in the same manner that the majority contracts are structured. I think that this is a reasonable and fair proposal. Second, this contract offers not even a general description of the type of work to be done by this firm. Not only is the work to be done at an unknown corporate office, the type of work to be done is a closely guarded secret. Every contract proposed by the majority has contained a general description of the work to be done by the consultant and the general issue area. This is a standard practice. Today, members are being asked to vote in the dark. As I said before, I think the offer we have made to our friends in the minority is more generous than we ever would have received during all of the years that we served in the minority. Despite the fact that not a single Democrat here today voted for Dick's contract, I am still willing to work with you, Mr. Waxman, to resolve some of these problems. I believe that we could reach an agreement on a contract that the entire committee could support. If that is not possible, then I must reluctantly oppose this contract. Do any further members seek to be recognized on this issue? Mr. Chairman, if you'd yield to me. Uh, I'll be happy to yield to my colleague. I want to point out that we have supported all the consultants requested by the majority. We have tried to uh, structure the conflict of interest con uh, issue with the Emerald Group in the same way that you've handled uh, Mr. Bennett's agreement. Uh, we uh, cannot agree to let the uh, majority uh, have such supervisory role as you would if they were individuals as opposed to an organization. We don't know what your consultants do. They operate for you, and we agreed to let them do that. Uh, we want uh, the ability for a very specific project of checking out Republican conduit payments to have this uh, group that we think is quite qualified to handle it. and. Uh, uh, we think uh, offer the best uh, services to accomplish this goal. We have a disagreement. It's not unusual on this committee that we have a disagreement. Uh, you are the chairman of the majority party, which means your uh, party has the majority and uh, has exercised that uh, every uh, step of the way to succeed in accomplishing uh, your goals. And I expect uh, you'll do the same here. Uh, I know that there are members who have other uh, places they have to be and rather than ask for a recorded vote, uh, we'll uh, ask only for a voice vote uh, uh, on this matter. I do want to put in the record a, a letter from the Emerald Group to me that I referred to in my opening statement. Without objection. Let me just say that uh, the majority is investigating uh, both Democrat and Republican conduit payments, contrary to some of the media reports. And we will continue to do that wherever we find uh, illegal activities or alleged illegal activities we are going to investigate. And with that, is there further discussion on the issue? If not, the question occurs on the contract offered by Mr. Waxman. All those in favor of the contract will signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed will signify by saying no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it, the noes have it, and the contract is not agreed to. We now have a, do we have a vote on the floor? Mr. Chairman, could I ask you one question? Uh, yes. Uh, you you made a statement that you're investigating some Republican conduit payments. We have n no knowledge of that. Can you tell us anything more about that? Uh, Mr. Bennett, you want to respond in briefly? Uh, Congressman Waxman, uh, for the record, uh, uh, joint detail, agents of both this committee, including um, the particular individual assigned to your staff, were in California last week. And I won't on the record say what was done, but there were matters that the inquiry concerned uh, contributions from a foreign source, and the inquiry concerned a clear record of uh, distribution of those contributions to a Republican candidate. And I'd be glad to deal with that in some detail, obviously, in a better setting. 
Well, I, I appreciate that. Uh, if these are joint detailees, they're supposed to report. No, this was. These were not the joint detailees. I believe it's Harry, and I've forgotten his last name. I can. Is there any other example, Mr. Bennett? Well, I, Mr. Wax, I'm glad to go with in more detail, but clearly, la as of last week, we were seeking to do that as well. So some, it's not a correct statement. These, nevertheless, some of these things uh, we're, we're, we're looking at, and we're not ready to make public. But uh, we well, we're not asking it to be made public. But I we, your colleagues happy. on the committee, if you're doing an investigation for the first time in our knowledge that involved Republicans. I think you ought to let us know about it. We certainly will, Mr. Waxman. I'll be happy to consult with you and your counsel as soon as possible. Uh, we have a vote on the floor, and I know that uh, we, we want to go through these hearings as, uh, without as any interruptions if it's possible. So why don't we go ahead and vote and come back as quickly as possible and we'll get into the meat of the hearing. We stand in recess to follow the gallery. Committee will come to order. Uh, the gentleman, Mr. Stott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I seek unanimous consent to enter into the record a number of uh, news clippings relative to our um, our investigation. And the, the first one is from a Capitol Hill magazine, which suggests that um, senior aides in the Dole campaign were involved in a, uh, at least it alleges they were involved in a kickback scheme uh, in, in the, the latter days of the campaign. And another is from the newspaper, the Wall Street Journal, referencing, unfortunately, a Pennsylvania family uh, who gave uh, close to $2 million uh, to uh, some issue advocacy groups having to do with okay. the triad management. Uh, and there are a number of other ones. Uh, and I, I mention these now, and I want to assert these in the record, because I think that because of the chairman's statement earlier, we've crossed a major Rubicon in that we now have a, an investigation that we will look at Republican misdeeds. And I want to thank the chairman for that and seek unanimous consent that these matters be entered into the record because it may help uh, lead our investigators towards some of the misdeeds that may have been prevalent on the, uh, on the Republican side. Without objection. Before the uh, distinguished ranking member and I deliver our opening statements, the committee must first dispose of some procedural issues. Pursuant to an agreement reached last night with Mr. Ruff, and I would like to thank Mr. Ruff for coming up to our office on the Hill last night. I know it was a strain on you and your staff, but we appreciate your Not call. at all, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members are advised that they may not release copies of the documents listed on the White House privilege log dated October 21st, 1997. These documents, which relate to the Hudson dog track issue, do not implicate core presidential powers or responsibilities. They do not implicate national defense, national security, or foreign policy concerns. They do not implicate the appointment or removal power of the president. In fact, they don't even implicate a decision the president would ever be called to make. However, because these documents are still subject to presidential claims of privilege, we have agreed to meet again in a collegial way to discuss the committee's future public use of these documents. Members may refer to the documents by noting the description on the privilege log and may discuss with the witnesses the documents generally. However, members should not quote in large part from the documents or release them publicly at this time. Furthermore, consistent with the unanimous consent agreement I am about to offer, Members may quote from depositions pertinent to, to, pertinent to today's hearings. However, the committee will not make them public today. They will only be made public after Mr. Ruff has had an opportunity to review the depositions. He needs a couple of days to notify the committee about any deposition testimony which may be subject to privilege. Staff will redact any material subject to privilege, and then the redacted depositions will be made public. 
With that understanding, I ask unanimous consent that members be able to use the depositions of Lanny Brewer, Michael Ambrosio, Cheryl Mills, Dimitri Neonakis, Jack Quinn, Stephen Smith, Colonel Joseph Simmons, and Alan Sullivan at today's hearing. Without objection, so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that those depositions be made public after the counsel to the president notifies the committee that the deposition material is not subject to privilege or after the committee staff redacts material after the counsel to the president notice, notifies the committee staff as to material subject claims of privilege. Without objection. Reserving uh, the right to object. The gentleman reserves the right to object. The gentleman will state his reservation. <laughs> You're uh, asking unanimous consent that we make these depositions public after we have uh, information from the White House as to what uh, ought to be redacted because it is privileged. Is this decision up to the White House or is it up to our committee counsel to decide uh, what will be uh, withheld and redacted? I think last night we, we decided that there would be a, 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 a a conference between the White House and our uh, committee staff, the general counsel, Mr. Bennett, and uh, that would be a decision that would be made pretty much jointly. Well, if I might inquire, then what you're asking us to agree to by unanimous consent is uh, an agreement that you've made with the White House on this information. Is that correct? I think that's correct. Okay. I, I withdraw my reservation. Reserving the right to object. Uh, the gentleman states his uh, reservation. I am willing to trust the chairman, the ranking member, and the White House counsel in working through this at this point, but I'm very concerned that one of the processes here is, is that we make as much public as possible because that's part of the education of the general public and understanding because this is an oversight committee that hopefully will lead potentially to changes in how both how the government behaves directly and what laws might need to be changed, and part of that is minimizing the information that is not available. I, 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 I the gentleman's point is well taken. Let me just say that uh, the committee reserves the right to release these documents, but we felt after consultation with Mr. Ruff last night that they deserved an adequate uh, amount of time to make their case uh, regarding privilege. And if they could not make their case, then of course we would go ahead and make the documents public. Will the Which gentleman yield to me? I, I appreciate your comment. I agree with it completely. That's why we sought to make all of the depositions public that had been taken by this committee uh, and we were defeated on that on a party line uh, vote. But I do think the public ought to get the depositions, be able to review them, because I don't think there's anything in all the 50 depositions that this committee has taken. And that's the reason I submit that the Republicans uh, defeated our attempt to make it public. But your statement was you think these, things, these depositions ought to be out, uh, the public ought to be able to see them. I fully support that. Without objection, so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that copies of the deposition listed in the Deputy Independent Counsel's November 5, 1997 letter, except the deposition of Gina Ratliff, be transmitted to the Office of the Independent Counsel. Reserving the right to object. The gentleman will state his reservation. I, I have no objection to uh, releasing these documents to uh, Ken Starr. If uh, they, these are relevant in any way to his investigation, he should have them. But I want to remake the point I just uh, stated for the record. I believe we should also be releasing these depositions to the public. I would uh, note for the record that the minority members offered a motion to release these depositions at a recent committee meeting, and we were voted down on a party line vote. The Republicans voted not to let the public have uh, these depositions and to be able to review them and to see what was said in a secret, closed door deposition of these uh, witnesses. So I, let's give them to Ken Starr. That's your unanimous consent request, and I will not object to it, but I want to use this opportunity to point out that he's not the only one who should get these depositions. The American people should see how this committee has spent its money in depositions and what we have to show for it. I withdraw my reservation. Without, does the gentleman, Mr. Souter, have further comments? No, I withdraw my objection. Without objection, so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that questioning in the matter under consideration proceed under Clause 2J2 of House Rule 11 and committee rule 14 in which the chairman and ranking minority member allocate time to committee counsel as they deem appropriate for extended questioning not to exceed 60 minutes equally divided between the majority and minority. We have no objection. Without objection, so ordered. I ask further unanimous consent that questioning in the matter under consideration. I ask unanimous consent that the witnesses and member statements appear in the record in their entirety. Without objection. 
I ask further unanimous consent that questioning in the matter under consideration proceed under Clause 2J2 of the House Rule 11 and Committee Rule 14, in which the Chairman and Ranking Minority Member allocate time to members of the committee that, as they deem appropriate for extended questioning, not to exceed 60 minutes equally divided. We've already covered that. Without objection, so order. Mr. Chairman, if we're making unanimous consent requests, uh, let me suggest as a way to expedite our hearing today, we have two panels, and since they're all from the same uh, area in the White House, I'd, I'd suggest and make unanimous consent request that we put them all together, hear from all of them, and then we have questioning of, uh, of them uh, uh, by the members. And I have no problem if we go through several rounds if, so members will have a full opportunity to ask all the questions they want to ask. But it seems to me pretty wasteful to have two separate panels and, uh, uh, and, uh, and, to, and to go through uh, the testimony in two separate uh, groupings. Uh. The chair would object to that because we have some reasons to have these two panels split, and so uh, objection is heard. Uh, without objection, the previous question is ordered. The question is on the motion. Okay, we have a vote on the floor. We have a vote on the floor. I've been uh, notified, and we have opening statements. So before we have the opening statements, I think we'll recess once again. There probably will be numerous recesses today. There's some. Uh, dilatory tactics that's going to be employed on the floor. So I would urge members to get back as quickly as possible so there can be some continuity in the hearings. The chair recesses the committee to the fall of the gavel. Normally we would, uh, as a courtesy, wait for the uh, ranking minority member, but he's not returned. And because we have a lot of floor votes, we probably should go ahead. Right. The committee will uh, reconvene. Today we are addressing how the White House has complied with subpoenas issued by this committee in the course of its investigation into fundraising abuses and the funneling of foreign money into political campaigns. While the issue of the White House videotapes of fundraising events being held, withheld for months brings us to this point today, it is part of a bigger picture of a consistent pattern of lack of cooperation by the Clinton White House in any and all investigations. This conduct by the White House is just one of the bricks in the stone wall put up to stop this and other investigations. Other bricks in the stone wall include the over 60 witnesses who have taken the Fifth Amendment or fled the country, including a number of close friends of the President, such as Webb Hubble, John Wong, Mark Middleton, and Charlie Tree, and the remarkable lack of memory of so many of the key facts by those who are still available. This situation with the White House videotapes is hardly unique. It is part of a five-year history of stonewalling of any investigative body the House, the Senate, any number of independent councils, and even the President's own Justice Department. While we are addressing this matter publicly today, I would note that the Justice Department has already called before the grand jury various members of the White House 
counsel's office and other White House staffers regarding this very serious matter. Despite what many of us may feel is a weak investigation by the Attorney General, even General Reno did not feel she should have to tolerate such defiance of month-old subpoenas. It was only due to two months of pointed requests and questions from the Senate that these long subpoenaed items finally were turned over. Initially, the existence of videotapes of the White House copies was denied by the White House after a month of alleged inquiry into the matter. It then took another month of pressing from the Senate to finally result in the White House's compliance with months old subpoenas, which the White House counsel had assured us the White House had complied with. The Washington Post has written a series of editorials on how the White House responds to subpoenas and inquiries in dribs and drabs and provides varying accounts of various events as new pieces of information are uncovered. The story is the same. Run the clock, attack those who attempt to investigate, change the subject, drag everything out long enough that most will lose interest or energy. Those at the White House charged with the task of producing relevant records perhaps may not want to find out how, ma how many other shoes are yet to drop or where these other shoes may be located. As columnist Michael Kelly has observed, the White House is on a need-to-know basis about itself these days, and what it does not need to know and does not want to hear about grows and grows. Republicans in Congress are not the only ones who have been frustrated by the Clinton White House. As I already noted, the Attorney General has expressed her exasperation with White House foot dragging on the videotapes. Last Congress, we heard from one of the city's most respected senior Justice Department officials, Michael Shaheen, who testified before this committee during the Travelgate investigation that, quote, the lack of cooperation and candor, end quote, that he received from the Clinton White House was unprecedented in his 20-year Justice Department career in the Office of Personal Responsibility. At issue in that case were withheld documents pertaining to the Travel Office inquiry. Mr. Shaheen stated that in 1995, quote, even a minimal level of cooperation by the White House, end quote, would have resulted in documents requested two years earlier being produced. In that same investigation, we heard from the head of public integrity, Lee Rading, that he too was faced with an uncooperative White House. After a year of attempting to obtain documents about Harry Thomason in the travel office inquiry, Mr. Raddick wrote to Acting Criminal Division Chief Jack Keeney in September of 1994, stating, quote, at this point, we are not confident that the White House has produced to us all documents in its possession relating to the Thomasons' allegations. The White House's incomplete production greatly concerns us because the integrity of our review is completely dependent upon securing all relevant documents." End quote. Even after the Justice Department issued a subpoena to the White House because of Mr. Raddick's concerns, it was only after this committee subpoenaed documents from Harry Thomason that the White House and other documents which should have been provided years earlier, finally came to light, years, years after they were originally subpoenaed. Other instances of this unprecedented stonewalling of in investigations by the Clinton White House include White House billing records showing up in the White House private residence book room almost three years, three years after they were first subpoenaed. Webb Hubble, while he was essentially running the Justice Department, transferring Whitewater files to his basement at the same time the Justice Department was investigating this matter. A former bar bouncer at the White House, Craig Livingstone, inexplicably ending up with hundreds of FBI files on Reagan and Bush officials and the White House calling it a bureaucratic snafu. The FBI director called it an inexcusable invasion of property, privacy. The White House withholding subpoenaed records regarding the investigation of the Hudson Casino project from the House and Senate until the information made its way into the press. The White House delivering just a week ago documents on the White House database requested over a year ago by Chairman McIntosh. If anyone wonders why we must continue this investigation, just consider the history of this White House. Would anyone be surprised, including our witnesses today, if documents central to our investigation are still somewhere in the book rooms at the White House or basement offices or misplaced files? No doubt we will hear much about how many documents have been produced, but compliance with subpoenas is not measured by the pound. Quality does not mean compliance. It is not a mistake here or there that is troublesome. We all understand that mistakes will occur. It is the consistent patterns of behavior throughout five different White House councils that raise serious questions and concerns. Questions and concerns which I earlier noted are shared by my colleagues in the Senate as well as the Attorney General. 
and rightfully so. The atmosphere that has been created at the White House is that compliance with congressional subpoenas is not treated seriously. Sadly, this year it took a threat of contempt for the White House to produce many responsive records. And then the President attempted to claim executive privilege in May, something which Mr. Ruff told me the President did not intend to do when we first met on February 6, 1997. At that time, Mr. Ruff pledged the President's full cooperation. But this is a White House which has always had more staff operating on spin control than it has on document production. A White House which often hides the facts from its own people and its own lawyers. This is the White House which not only had a Johnny Chung giving $50,000 checks to the First Lady's Chief of Staff, which, but which saw Johnny Chung solicited by close friends of the First Lady to contribute $25,000 to the Back to Business Committee, a group set up by close friends of the President and First Lady to thwart any investigations and attack committee chairmen and independent counsels appointed by their own Justice Department. This is a White House which gathered documents back in October 1996 about John Wong and others and held on to those documents and held its collective breath until Election Day, trying to find out about how the DNC Vice Chairman, John Wong, raised money was attacked as, quote, partisan. Yet at least one candid White House staffer said a week before last year's presidential election, quote, all they, the DNC, are trying to do is push this back until after the election, and then we'll watch it all blow up. End quote. Let's take, for example, the White House coffees. Initially, the President said they were an opportunity for outreach, to stay in touch with people. The White House overnights, all 938 of them were friends. I did not have any strangers here, said the President. While it's hard to imagine that all 938 overnighters were friends, or that the President really needed to reach out and touch a Chinese arm dealer or a Florida drug dealer, now that we have the videotapes, we do indeed see that certain individuals, people central to this investigation, who have now taken the fifth or fled the country, were intimate friends or fled the country, were intimate friends of the president. A picture paints a thousand words. On one video, we see the Tree Team, which included Charlie Tree and the infamous Mr. Wu, the Macau gambling honcho who provided Tree with over a million dollars in wire transfers from overseas. It sends a message. The president was told when he posed with Mr. Tree, Mr. Wu and various of their business associates, it sends a message indeed. What message is sent by a president who made time for these shady characters but leaves human rights activists and friend of many of us, Harry Wu, like an unwanted orphan? It sends a message indeed. Why is the president meeting with Mr. Wu instead of the humanitarian Harry Wu? If anyone wants to know why we need to complete this investigation, they also should roll the videotapes of Zhang Ziyam being faded at the White House just a few days ago. Representative Nancy Pelosi said last week, quote, as the Clinton administration gives the 21-gun salute to President Zhang Ziyin today, which the Chinese government insisted upon, that President Clinton and all those assembled remember the shots fired in Tiananmen Square. The President's National Security Advisor, Tony Lake, said last week that the Chinese government has denied any plan to funnel money into our political system. Let's remember, they also denied killing anyone at Tiananmen Square. Does anyone really believe we have learned all there is to learn in these matters? There is much work left to do. The stone wall erected by the White House and the President's operatives must be taken down brick by brick. James Riotti sent me, whispered the Riotti intermediary, Arif Wiradonata, in a December coffee, 1995. Mr. Wiradonata provided $450,000 to the DNC, the legality of which was questioned over a year ago. Consider if the James Riotti sent me tape was public in October 1996 instead of October 1997. Would we have accepted the DNC's assurances that there was nothing to an Indonesian gardener of moderate income contributing close to half a million dollars to the DNC? The James Riotti sent me greeting brought an approving nod from the president. Now we have learned that Mr. Wiradonata's lawyers are telling him to stay out of the country, along with over 60 others who have taken the Fifth Amendment or fled the country. Mr. Wiradonata is just another brick in the White House stone wall. These videotapes are a treasure trove of information on the way this president worked for campaign cash. We now are able to see how those who have taken the Fifth and fled the country in order to obstruct this investigation were intimately engaged with the president who knew them on a first-name basis. A presidential hug for Johnny Chung, a 
Hi Pauline for Pauline from Channel Act, the woman who has fled the country and left multitudes of questions about her quarter of a million dollar DNC contribution. Questions, regrettably, which apparently create no curiosity on the part of the President, the White House, or many in Congress. Who are these people? And what were they doing at the White House? And I'd like to add one other thing that just came to my mind. I sent two letters to the President of the United States regarding Charlie Tree, asking him to talk to the Chinese government, and in particular, the Chinese President, about bringing Mr. Tree back before this committee so we could talk to him and ask him questions. And to my knowledge, and to the media's knowledge, that question was never asked of the Chinese president. And I'd like to know why the president didn't ask him that if he really wants to get to the bottom of this investigation. Could it be because Charlie Tree has answers we want and, and can't get as long as he's in China? That's something I'm very concerned about and I think other members of the uh, committee are concerned about as well. These pictures clearly provide a clearer picture of what we are investigating and the withholding of such information is inexcusable as the ranking member of this committee, Mr. Waxman, has acknowledged. They were clearly responsive to our subpoena of March 4, 1997. There is no contention about this. The President's counsel has admitted the videotapes should have been turned over. As we go forward in our investigation, the FBI signs more agents every day and additional cabinet members are under investigation by a slow-moving Justice Depart Department. Some would suggest we should stop investigating, but the role of oversight is to inform the American public of important information which may affect American policy. There is much left here yet to uncover. The fact that an unprecedented number of witnesses have either pled the Fifth Amendment or fled the country cannot and will not deter us even if it will make our task more lengthy and difficult. The White House should not be assisting in this stonewalling effort. Rather, the President should demand that the public servants who serve him make every effort to get at the truth. And with that, I yield to my colleague, Mr. Waxman, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Since our committee last met, Senator Thompson announced that he was bringing his hearings to a close. He held 32 hearings this year, but concluded he wasn't going to hold more hearings just for the sake of holding hearings. I completely agree with Senator Thompson's assessment that his hearings show the need for real campaign finance reform. Our system is broken and desperately needs fixing. In New York's special congressional election, for instance, just two days ago, more than $1 million in soft money was pumped into a single congressional race. That was inconceivable just eight years ago. This morning's Washington Post has an article, Fundraising Flourishes in the House. In the first six months of 1997, incumbent members of the House of Representatives raised $52.9 million, up $7.4 million from the comparable period two years ago, according to a new report by the Federal Election Commission. And they point out members who raised a lot of money recently, and they pointed out a lot of members who were holding on to a war chest. In terms of people who raised a lot of money, they they talked about Newt Gingrich, as of June 30th, raising uh, a million eight. And Richard Gephardt, the Democratic leader, a million four. Joe Kennedy, a million dollars. And, and others over, uh, over hundreds of thousands of dollars. They pointed out that some of our colleagues have stored away money. David Dreyer, 2.7, uh, over $2.7 million. He's holding on to. Uh, Joe Kennedy has a million eight. Dick Gephardt, a million one. Our chairman, $995,000. We need to change this system. People are out grubbing for money. And that's what we've seen in the Congress, and that's what we've seen from the presidential campaigns as well. That's only one of the reasons that nearly every Democrat on this committee and Representative Sanders has signed on to the discharge petition that would force a vote, just simply a vote on the House floor on campaign finance legislation. And I also want to mention that one member of the majority, Congressman Shays, has also signed that petition. And nearly every minority member supports passing a bill that would ban soft money. The fact that we have soft money that can be thrown into these campaigns, presidential and congressional, 
has meant that uh, we've seen extraordinary, extraordinary lengths at which people have gone to raise more and more money. At the same time, many of us are wondering why we're having this hearing today. Since Senator Thompson covered the same ground with the same witnesses last week, it might be a better use of our time to focus on other issues, like the triad management's role in the 1996 election. And I very much doubt when we hear that our majority is looking at Republican fan campaign finance abuses, they're looking into that one, they should. Or the Empire Landfills conduit contribution scheme. These were ignored by the Senate. They shouldn't be ignored by our committee. The continual duplication of the Senate's work suggests that the real objective may not be the truth, but to drive the Democratic Party further into debt. There are two points I want to make about today's hearing. First, the White House has an absolute obligation to provide Congress with information pursuant to legitimate information requests. No one on this committee, Republican or Democrat, will tolerate frivolous privilege claims or any attempt to hide important information from Congress. Over the past year, there have been a series of editorials in the Washington Post titled Dribs and Drabs. And I noticed, Chairman, you used the term dribs or drabs. The point of the series, which I think many members agree with, is that the White House has sometimes failed to provide needed or accurate information to the public. And at the same point, it matters less why that happens than the fact that it undermines credibility. In many instances, it is the failure to provide information when first requested and not even the substance of the information that's damaging. For this reason, my personal view is that careless mistakes, not malicious intent, is the likely explanation. Based on the evidence I've seen, there's no indication that Charles Ruff or his staff have intentionally misled the Congress. It is also essential that we put the White House's action in context. The White House has received over 1,100 requests for information from the House and the Senate, the Independent Counsel, and the Justice Department. They have spent millions of dollars complying with these requests and have worked with a small staff under tight deadlines. In a process like this, mistakes and omissions are possible. As important as it is for the White House to cooperate with us, we must be reasonable in our requests and careful in the accusations we make. In October, for instance, uh, Mr. Chairman, you appeared on Face the Nation and leveled a serious charge at the Clinton administration. You said that, quote, we think that some of those tapes may have been cut off intentionally. They have been altered in some way. Now, this very serious accusation was a lead story on the evening news and was the next day, and it was even set out in a, a prominent Washington Post headline, tapes may have been altered, Representative Burton says. There's only one problem. It's apparently not true. I know of no evidence that substantiates your charge. In fact, several witnesses who testified in the Senate, including Chief Petty Officer Charles McGrath, and Colonel Charles Campbell swore under oath that the videos have not been altered. The depositions that we are releasing today, or at least we're going to release after some of it, the uh, privilege information is redacted, will provide further evidence that there was no tampering. And I understand that Paul Ginsburg, a video expert hired by Senator Thompson, has also concluded that there was no tampering. Mr. Chairman, if you have some evidence on this matter, I hope you will share it with the committee this morning. If not, I would ask that you correct the record so that reputations are not needlessly impugned. Furthermore, I found your opening statement really curious because you attacked the president for entertaining some of these contributors at the White House. At the same time, you attacked the president for receiving the president of China. 
as if there was some conspiracy that the president of China coming to the White House had something to do with uh, these other characters. I, I, I just don't see it. And I have to say that you and I have not disagreed on policies that we voted on in the House when it's come to China, because both of us have voted against the most favored nation status with respect to China and strongly spoken out against human rights abuses in China. Speaker Gingrich received the President of China. Senator Lott received the President of China. The President of the United States received him as well. I think we have to be careful. I think the White House has to be careful to be sure to comply with the request for information or they're going to lose their credibility. And that is something they should take seriously. But I think we as members of Congress have to be careful when accusations are made. If there's no substantiating evidence for it, let us conduct an investigation to get the facts, to get to the truth, and not make statements for which there are no facts to substantiate them. I look forward to any new information that last week's hearing might have overlooked when these same witnesses appeared in the Senate. You have back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Waxman. Uh, we would like to ask uh, other members to submit their statements for the record so we can get uh, to our witnesses as quickly as possible. Uh, and with that, uh, Mr. Ruff and Ms. Mills, uh, would you raise your right hand, please? Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give before this committee be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth of God? I do. Thank you. Mr. Bennett? Excuse me. Mr. Chairman, I believe Mr. Ruff has an opening statement well, he desires me, I'm to sorry, make. I'm sorry, I, I agree. Chuck? Uh, Mr. Ruff, uh, you're recognized uh, for an opening statement. If you could keep it to five minutes, we'd appreciate it. Mr. Chairman, I'll do my best to uh, abide by that constraint. I submitted my opening statement uh, two days ago, uh, and I will read it into the record. But I want to begin with one very brief, very pointed response, Mr. Chairman, to your opening. There is not in my office, there never has been, and there never will be defiance, stonewalling, obstruction, or any other inappropriate conduct. My orders from the President of the United States are to cooperate with this committee's legitimate demands. We do so, and that's all we do. Now, my colleagues and I are here to respond the committee's questions today concerning compliance with your document requests and subpoenas. When we've answered those questions, I'm confident that the committee will conclude that our, offer, our efforts have been diligent and our compliance with the committee's demands exemplary. It's inevitable in any adversarial setting that there will be disagreements about process and substance. Mr. Chairman, you and I have disagreed on occasion. You've been candid in letting me know your concerns, and I trust that you've found my responses equally candid. Our staffs, too, have had disagreements, most of which have been resolved just as they should be by ongoing discussion. When we have found some requests to be overbroad, your staff has often been willing to narrow them. When demands have strained our resources, we've been able to prioritize your requests. When concerns over privilege have arisen, We've been able to establish a process that ensures committee access to all relevant documents. And I'll pause here for a moment to reiterate what I said earlier, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your taking the time to meet with me last night to resolve what I think was really a procedural question about how these issues ought to be addressed. It was symptomatic, I think, of the relationship we've developed in which we're honest with each other about our concerns and we try to find solutions to them. When the committee's made special requests for expedited production, we've done our best to respond. At every stage, we've worked to give the committee the information it needs. Where we have erred, we've been forthright in admitting it, and we've done our best to correct mistakes as quickly as possible. But I submit that considering the extraordinary number and breadth of the demands placed on us by this committee and other investigative bodies, those mistakes have been few. On that point, let me address one of the principal issues that has brought us here today, the recent discovery and production of the videotapes. The charges of impropriety surrounding that discovery 
although readily disposed of, are symptomatic of a tendency on the part of some, I submit, to reach hasty and ill-considered conclusions. We do not dispute that the videotapes were responsive to the committee's subpoenas and should have been found and produced some months ago. But the record developed over the last month makes it clear beyond any doubt that the reason they were not found was simple and innocuous. One page of my directive, faxed from the White House Military Office to the White House Communications Agency, was misplaced. Walk up personnel have testified that if they'd received that page, they would have searched their computer looking for tapes of the coffees. There was no conspiracy. There was no effort to obstruct justice. There was no stonewalling. There was only a mistake of the most mechanical, routine, and innocent variety. Thus, the suggestion that the videotapes were concealed or their production delayed for some ulterior purpose is absolutely baseless. Nor is there any basis whatsoever for the claim that the tapes were altered before they were produced. The walk-up professionals, career military personnel, have testified that they retrieved the original tapes from the archives and copied them, nothing else. Now, I began with the issue of the videotapes because just as the charges that have been levied concerning their discovery are baseless, so is the more general allegation that the White House has been deliberately slow in responding to subpoenas or has somehow been concealing relevant documents. Those who make such accusations need to understand two things. First, to withhold for tactical or political purposes documents responsive to this committee's legitimate demands would be inconsistent with our professional responsibility a responsibility that all the lawyers in my office take very seriously. Second, to search for documents in the White House is an enormous task. There are some 2,000 employees in some 40 different units within the executive office of the president. No matter how focused a search request may be, and most are far from that, it may require us to contact every one of those 2,000 people, examine every one of their files, search the central record storage system as well. Faced with deadlines from this committee and others that any dispassionate observer would find extraordinarily short, my lawyers have worked 100-hour weeks to meet the committee's in a demands in a manner that deserves, I submit, not criticism but praise. When we receive a subpoena, a letter, or merely a phone call, we respond as rapidly as possible. When a subpoena is broad-ranging or numerous requests have been received from various investigative bodies, we issue a directive to all personnel of the executive office asking them to search our, their files. Lawyers in our office are available to answer questions or assist in the search. In addition, my lawyers visit the individual offices that are most likely to contain responsive files and work with the Office of Records Management to guide their search for archived documents. In response to more limited requests, we conduct targeted searches or send special directives to those persons who are most likely to have responsive materials. And for waves records, phone logs, and emails, we search the mounds of papers ourselves, often in response to some emergency request. No process, however careful, can ensure error-free compliance, particularly given the demands and the deadlines we have faced. Indeed, any lawyer who has been involved in large-scale document production, even in routine civil litigation, will understand that mistakes, sometimes larger, sometimes smaller, are inevitable. We can, however, take all reasonable steps to minimize the chances of error, and to that end, we have continued to search to make sure that we found every responsive document. When we find such a document, we produce it. That is the responsible and professional course that any lawyer would follow. It is a course, Mr. Chairman, that is consistent with my mandate from the President to respond forthrightly to this committee's legitimate demands. No one has ever so much as hinted that we do anything less, and neither the President nor I would accept anything less. And with that, Mr. Chairman, we're happy to respond to the committee's questions. Thank you, Mr. Ruff. Uh, Ms. Mills, do you have an opening statement? I do not. You do not? I do not. Okay, thank you. Mr. Bennett? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Ruff, Ms. Mills, uh, good morning, almost good afternoon. I want to. Thank you for your patience. Uh, Mr. Ruff, I too want to thank you for your visit up here last night, and I enjoyed our meeting. Uh, 
Maybe first for the record note, Ms. Mills, you are accompanied here by your attorney, Mr. Neil Eggleston, is that correct? That is correct. Mr. Eggleston, if you want to be seated to your client next to the table, you're welcome to do so, sir. If at any time you want to stop my questions, please so advise. Mr. Ruff, you did not arrive as chief counsel to the president until late January or early February of this year, is that correct? February 10th was my first day, Mr. Bennett. Had you previously served in any capacity at the White House in any previous administrations? No, I had not. What was the general status of very investigative matters upon your arrival? I think uh, it's fair to say that they rested in various stages. Some matters uh, were left over from the previous Congress, and actions were being taken to respond to a variety of requests that had been lodged over the preceding months. Uh, others were just gearing up. For example, uh, we were aware that the Thompson Committee was about to begin, but hadn't yet begun its work. Similarly, the work of this committee was just beginning, and indeed, I think maybe even before I arrived uh, in my office, I had my first meeting with the chairman. And that would have been, I believe, February 6th of this year, is that correct? I believe that's correct. So essentially, there were matters having to do with the Senate, the House, uh, the Department of Justice, and independent counsel as you arrived on the scene, is that correct? That's true. Um, you will note that there were, in fact, earlier directives uh, from your predecessor, Mr. Jack Quinn, concerning information sought by these investigative bodies. And I believe if we can uh, put up on the screen uh, certain directives which had been previously sent by uh, Mr. Quinn, Exhibits 135, a directive, I believe, in October of 96. Uh, Exhibit 136, a directive of December 16, 1996. And Exhibit 137, uh, I believe, was a directive of January 9, 1997. Did, did you have occasion to review those directives from your predecessor when you arrived, Mr. Ruff? Uh, in the days and weeks following my arrival, I reviewed these directives as part of my ongoing effort to try to catch up with the state of affairs and begin to address how we would go about making production. I note with respect to the first directive, Exhibit 135, looking at the second page, that that directive included the particular attached request for information or subpoena. I think it's on the television screen in front of you, sir, but if you want to take a minute to look at the document. No, unhappily, the screen is only modestly legible. I'm sorry. Yes, I see it. And th that directive, in, in fact, Mr. Quinn just also attached the re particular request for information which had come from the investigative body. Isn't that correct? Um, yes, that appears to be the case. Ms. Mills, you, in fact, worked with Mr. Quinn prior to working with Mr. Ruff. Is that correct? That is correct. And what is your present title? Deputy counsel to the president. You are essentially the number two lawyer in the office, is that right? There are two deputy counsels, myself and Mr. Bruce Lindsay. So essentially only Mr. Ruff outranks you in the office of White House counsel, is that correct? <laughs> I don't like to think of it that way. That's right. Well, I want to ask if you outrank Mr. Ruff. Let me just rephrase my question. Um, you had been, in fact, been employed during the first term of the Clinton administration in the office of White House counsel. Yes. And uh, you... Uh, in fact, uh, assisted Mr. Quinn in the preparation of these directives that we've just placed up on the screen. Isn't that correct? No, it's not. I think, as you know from my deposition testimony, this first directive I was not involved in. The second directive I was. Well, I'm sorry, Ms. Mills. I did not take your deposition, and I apologize for that I'm error. sorry. I thought you had my transcript. Yeah, I, I have looked at part of it. But uh, then you assisted in the second directive. Is that correct. correct? And how about the third directive? Did you assist in the preparation of that directive? Yes. All right. So then... I misstated as to the first of the three, but then uh, directives two and three in December and January, you prepared those? That's exactly correct. And whose decision was it to attach copies of the actual request, whether it was a, re a request for documents or a subpoena? Uh, did you make a decision to attach the particular request with these directives from Mr. Quinn? Um, I think you're speaking about the first directive, and I was not involved in the first directive. The second two directives actually were with respect to a request that we had received, and we went about uh, ensuring that we put all the information from the particular requester in there in a form that would be understandable to our staff. Ms. Mills, was it Mr. Quinn's policy to generally uh, seek to attach the particular document, request, or subpoena to a directive? No. And directing your attention to the, uh, the group of lawyers who arrived, uh, in fact, uh, you and Mr. Lindsay were the only two holdovers from the first term. Isn't that correct? 
That's incorrect. At that time, there were several other members of the council's office who were still there, who were still there, but they have since departed. Well, let me ask you this: Is it safe to say by February or March of this year that essentially there had been a complete turnover, with the exception of you and Mr. Lindsay? I think by in, by June that would be an accurate statement. And by mid-January of this year, just actually prior to Mr. Ruff's arrival, there were a considerable number of documents which had already been compiled. Isn't that right? We were beginning the collection with respect to the December 16th and January 9th. At that point, we had compiled documents. We had not completed, obviously, compiling all the materials, nor had we um, began all the production related to those materials, as I think you might know. In fact, in late January, early February, or right around the time of Mr. Ruff's arrival, a significant number of documents were turned over to the Department of Justice uh, under your supervision. Isn't that correct? Um, I believe somewhere on the order of 3,000 pages had been turned over at that point. And in terms of your efforts for document compliance and searching for m information, you had actually gone through a number of documents yourself with respect to Mr. John Wong. Isn't that correct? Yes. In fact, you sent an aide down to the photo office to see if you could find photographs of Mr. Wong or the Riottis at some point in time? Um, with respect to the waves request, when we were getting press requests from a number of different individuals, we made an attempt to go through and identify all the different wave records from Mr. Wong. I believe we had a request from this committee for that information as well. And so in the course of trying to establish which was the correct John Wong, and which was an individual who was also named John Wong, but not the same John Wong, that's how we went about trying to discern the appropriate visitor and uh, determining whether or not Mr. Wong was or was not the correct John Wong. And during that process, did you, in fact, deal with the White House Communications Agency, better known as WACA? I dealt with the photo office. I did not deal with the audiovisual section of the, uh, of the WACA. I think, as you probably are aware, I was not familiar with their practices with regard to videotaping. With respect to uh, directing your attention to January 15th of this year, prior to Mr. Ruff's arrival, there was, in fact, a letter sent by Chairman Burton of this committee. I believe it's Exhibit 138 that's on the screen now. Uh, with respect to the matter of compliance with document request of this committee, did you discuss th this matter with Mr. Ruff when he arrived? Um, when everyone arrived, there was, as you would say, a, there was a large number of individuals who arrived to do the investigative work, and I did sit down with the new staff who were going to be doing the investigative work to apprise them of what had taken place to that point and also what matters we had that had just come in that needed to be addressed. In fact, your office uh, is direct right next door to Mr. Ruff's office in the White House, is that right? It is now. At the time that you're speaking of, it was in the old executive office. Bed. And when did your office move next door to Mr. Ruff's? Uh, early February. Uh, upon his arrival? I believe that's correct. Incidentally, Ms. Mills, just to correct perhaps a misimpression by Congressman Waxman, you did not testify before the Senate, is that correct? No, I did not. Um, Ms. Mills, uh, with respect to the time period of February 6, at the time that Mr. Ruff met with Chairman Burton, uh, I assume that except for Bruce Lindsay, uh, there were basically no other persons upon whom Mr. Uh, Ruff could rely for document production in that I think Mr. Brewer has testified that at least he thought by February or March, Mr. Brewer in an earlier deposition testimony, that by February or March the entire new team had arrived. So I gather that upon Mr. Ruff's arrival and you're taking the office next to Mr. Ruff, that Mr. Ruff was relying upon you to assist him in efforts at document production upon his arrival? That's correct. I was transitioning those matters. There was one member of the team who arrived in December of 1996, but apart from that, that's correct. Mr. Ruff, uh, ultimately uh, there was a subpoena that was served upon the committee, the subject subpoena for your appearance today, and I believe that's Exhibit 139, the March 4th subpoena. Mr. Ruff, do you know, according to your records, who actually received the subpoena and receded it? I do not. Uh, that tends to vary depending on uh, how it is delivered at what time of day and who happens to be present, but we view it as having been served on and received by the uh, Office of White House Counsel. Who made the initial determination as to who was going to ensure compliance with that subpoena and gather the requested material? I, I think it's fair to say, Mr. Bennett, that uh, we treated this subpoena as we would uh, any other subpoena or request for documents. Uh, principal responsibility for responding to these sorts of subpoenas vested in what I'll refer to as the investigative uh, side of my office, which is headed by Mr. Brewer is special counsel to the president. Uh, Ms. Mills and Mr. Ruff, I'll note that paragraph one of page one of that subpoena uh, clearly calls for videotapes. Isn't that correct? That's what 
refers to video or audio recording, yes. And uh, I, I believe, and if I'm incorrect in this regard, correct me, Mr. Ruffin, and I note and have appreciated your, your great candor in our meetings in terms of the uh, error and not turning material over, but uh, neither of you dispute the fact that the videotapes recently produced by the White House were clearly within the scope of this subpoena back in March of this year. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. Now, Mr. Ruff, uh, there was a directive which you ultimately sent out on April 28, 1997, I believe noted as Exhibit 140, that we'll place on the screen. Yes, sir. Is there any reason why there was almost a two-month delay uh, before forwarding this directive to members of your staff to seek compliance with this subpoena? This directive is uh, my best recollection, Mr. Bennett, was intended to encompass a variety of requests and subpoenas received not only from uh, this committee but from uh, other investigative bodies as well. Uh, there had been, as you know, during the uh, uh, February, March, April period, ongoing uh, efforts to collect documents and produce them that were responsive to the f earlier Quinn directives as well as specific searches that were being conducted. Uh, this really was designed to wrap up a whole range of different requests that uh, uh, had come into the office. Ms. Mills, uh, you were in fact aware of the existence of the entity known as the White House Communications Agency uh, as early as last year, 1996, weren't you? Yes. Uh, in fact, uh, that is the entity that produces the videotapes that are subject to question here, among the many questions we have. <laughs> It is the entity that produces them, among the lots of other responsibilities that they have. And uh, if I can, showing you Exhibit 141, which is a memorandum in April of 1996 uh, from Mr. Quinn, noting that that agency, WACA, would be recording political events. You, in fact, were assisted in authoring that memorandum in April of 1996. Is that correct? That's correct. It indicates that it would be reporting presidential remarks as opposed to political events. But essentially, you were aware of the, the, the efforts of WACA in that regard. Well, my interactions with WACA at that time were not to walk through a memo. As you probably are aware, there's a precursor memo that WACA sent to me outlining what their activities were. With respect to that memo, we were focused on, in particular, activities and support that they provided that were telecommunications related. For example, when the president travels, every trip that he takes, there is always a staff room associated with it. There are computers, faxes, phones, and other equipment. Walker wanted to ensure that they were appropriately following the guidelines that had been laid out in earlier memoranda that we had sent out regarding political activity. So our discussions related to those matters, as opposed to what other practices or activities that they might actually engage in as an agency. Showing you a memorandum four months later, once again involving you with Waka. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. Mills, because I'm really not sure of this, but uh, Exhibit 141A uh, is a memorandum in August of 1996. And there, I believe there's a noting as to guidelines as to the taping of political events by this agency. Is that correct? If you're speaking about on the second page when it talks about reporting presidential remarks, it is. And as you probably are aware, there's a precursor memo to this memo from WACA that is identical. Um, almost to this memo. And so what I was trying to do was ensure that I was providing advice to our staff regarding the activities that they indicated that they did and didn't do. Right. Well, just so you understand, there's a limited amount of time, so I can't necessarily produce each document to lead into the next one. No, I, I understand, but I noticed yeah. that that one was not here. So I in, just in fact, to correct me if I'm wrong, but your personal notation is in your handwriting at the top of that page to the right, isn't it? Right. And uh, did you at that time that notation there in terms of your handwriting on that memorandum, did, did you at that time have a general discussion with audiovisual officials with respect to the particular events that were going to be videotaped by WACA over the uh, no, course of the I, presidential campaign? No, and as I think as you're probably aware, the individuals with whom I met were not familiar with what uh, WACA's audiovisual practices were at that time. Indeed, Mr. Steve Smith was not yet assigned to the audiovisual unit. So he was unaware of what practices they had with regard to what they taped and what they didn't tape. And the other individuals also, I think, as you probably are aware from testimony in the Senate, were unaware at that time. And so we did not discuss that. Indeed, what we were trying to ensure was, with respect to the president's political activity during a time period where there would be a considerable amount 
that we were making sure that WACA's resources with respect to their phones, their faxes, their equipment, and their computers were being used appropriately. And that was particularly of interest because in this time period forward, the President's activity at that time was primarily uh, campaign related. Well, Ms. Miller, in fact, I can't represent to you that I have read all the, the Senate testimony, but um, Stephen Smith, I believe, testified before the Senate within the last two weeks that you came to speak with him about the role of WACA in filming events. Is that correct? That is not correct. And his testimony would be incorrect in that regard? I'm not familiar that he had made testimony with respect to us having discussions regarding WACA's filming. But if, if that was the extent of his testimony, then you would disagree with that? I would disagree with that, though it's my understanding that Mr. Smith has indicated that we did not discuss Walker's videotaping practices at that time. Indeed, he was not familiar with them at that time. Uh, Ms. Mills, in fact, you are on one of the videotapes that was released uh, within the last few weeks. I think the March 11, 1995 videotape, if I can have exhibit Roman numeral 6 or V1. And uh, if we can just quickly. Mr. Chairman. That is, in fact, parliamentary inquiry, Mr. Chairman. That's my lovely family. Okay, I see it. Was you and your family there? Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. I'll stop, Mr. Chairman. There's a Mr. Chairman. I have a parliamentary inquiry here. Mr. Chairman, when we're requesting information for someone to respond to testimony, we should provide that test or the transcript of that testimony so the witness can familiarize himself with it. Point is well taken, <laughs> Ms. Mills. In that Mr. regard, Chairman, Mr. Chairman, I had an inquiry too. Gentleman state is inquiry. Do, do we have a copy of all the exhibits that are being shown here? I understand there may have been one copy given to the to the minority. It's difficult when we see a corner of a picture to know what the probative value of that is. What? Yeah, I mean it would be helpful for us as we go through these. So when counsel is asking a question, we see more than just the, the part that's on the screen. Well, I'd be glad to respond to that, Mr. Chairman. Please, Mr. Bennett. Well, 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 the, the, the tape is. Uh, a congressman is quite lengthy. It wasn't my intent to play the entire tape. No, not the tape. I'm, I'm actually referring more to the, the prior one we saw. Um, it's the, the prior exhibit that we saw on, on the screen here. Uh, what I would like to do is be able to, to look at the whole document as you are showing it on the screen and Gen know what the document is. Gentleman, yield to me. Yes, I would yield. I just want to point out that the majority gave us these documents and we're now trying to duplicate them. They just gave it to them. To us just now. Okay. So we're trying to get uh, make copies as quickly as possible. In, in the future, we'll try to make sure the documents relevant to the hearings will be provided in advance. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Mr. Chairman, no, no Chairman? attempt to be dilatory either. I just want to. There have been a series of questions in which the witness has said, as you are aware, and and as and, and the, the, I guess the concern that would be that would arise out of that is that if if the council has some information. To the contrary, or that would infer a different slant of things. Um, I mean, th this just seems to be something going on that that I'm not. It's, I'm well, not sure. Relevant, here, relevant documents. Relevant okay. documents. We'll try to make sure are given to the minority so that they're they're aware. Thank of Thank you. And to the witness. Uh, uh, just regarding Congressman Pata, um, there's nothing going on between Ms. Mills and myself. Uh, we, uh, Mr. Chairman, <laughs> we, I think we've met each other once before. Is that correct, Ms. Mills? In case my I'm wife happens to watch that this. Uh, that's right. Yes, Mr. Kondorsky. Yeah, if I may follow up on Mr. Fatah, I think what he's indicating is that is the counsel examined and asked, you, as you are aware, Mr. Smith testified such and such in the Senate. Now, and, and, and then that was not her recollection that she's aware that he so testified. It would be awfully uh, uh, helpful if there is that type of testimony that the counsel is aware of that the staff immediately provides us with it. We, we would follow up and provide said, it to the witness. As I said, Mr. Kondorsky, uh, we, we uh, in the future will try to make sure that depositions or testimony given in the other body that's uh, being referred to will be provided to all members. Mr. Bennett. Yes, uh, Ms. Mills, uh, I think just for the record, you and I think have met once before uh, Friday morning, October the 10th, in Mr. Ruff's office. Is that correct? I believe that's correct. And uh, this is only the second time you and I have actually spoken uh, today. Isn't that correct? I believe it is. Right. And uh, to the extent that you indicate, as, as I may be aware, I, I, I don't presume that I'm as aware of some of the facts as you are, and I'm just trying to get to some facts. But if, 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 if to any extent I summarize something you think is inaccurate, please correct me and note right. if you will. I'm assuming that you have my deposition transcripts because that was what I was informed at my deposition. So if you don't have them, then I'm I know I do. Absolutely. Absolutely. I don't. So, okay. okay. Right. I have yours. Thank you. Right. Um, directing your attention to June of, of this year, 
Uh, Mr. Ruff, I'll show you your letter of June 27th, which is Exhibit 142. Yes, sir. And essentially at that time, you represented to uh, Chairman Burton that to your knowledge, uh, your staff had complied with all requests contained in the subpoena. Is that correct? That's correct. As you'll uh, note, my letter states, to the best of my knowledge, the White House has produced all documents responsive to the committee's subpoenas, with the exception of those documents that appear on the privilege logs, and then goes on in the next paragraph to note our continuing efforts to ensure that we have been fully productive of uh, these documents and that we are, our searches are continuing and we will produce documents that we find. Did you have any knowledge of the existence of videotapes um, at that time, Mr. Ruff? No, I did not. Ms. Mills, uh, did, at any time did Ms. Mills uh, indicate to you, Mr. Ruff, that there were videotapes? No, sir. Uh, and did you ever inquire of Ms. Mills as to whether or not she knew of any videotapes? No, I did not. Were there any discussions with her? Uh, many discussions with her about the general duties of uh, our office, including the discovery and production of documents, but nothing that was focused on the issue of videotapes. Uh, according to, again, just as a matter of public record and not trying to given the concerns of the minority, not trying to repeat um, the testimony of the Senate, but I think that everyone is aware of the testimony of the, the Senate, and if I've summarized this incorrectly, correct me, Mr. Ruff, but according to testimony presented in the Senate, there came a point in time where, an, uh, where Attorney Donald Buckland of Senator Thompson's committee inquired of your office with respect to the existence of some taping. Isn't that correct? I believe the sequence of events is essentially this, Mr. Bennett. Uh, that in a conversation with Michael Ambrosio of my office on August 7th, uh, Mr. Buckland raised with Mr. Ambrosio the question whether there was some form of clandestine uh, taping of conversations in the Oval Office and asked him to inquire into that. Uh, then later in August, I believe the date was August 19th, Mr. Buckland sent a letter to Mr. Brewer uh, asking more broadly about the activities of WACA. Uh, the first time, I believe, in which the issue of videotaping coffee was broached was at a meeting between Mr. Ambrosio and Mr. Buckland on September 9th, in which Mr. Ambrosio described the preliminary results of his inquiry uh, to Mr. Buckland, told him that there was no evidence of clandestine taping, uh, that there was taping of DNC fundraisers, that he didn't believe that the coffees had been videotaped, but that he would continue to search to be sure uh, of the story on that subject. Well, with respect to the, your interpretation of possible clandestine taping, and I believe that's your word, sir, uh, did you discuss with Ms. Mills uh, a question from a counsel for the Senate that you interpreted to ask about clandestine taping at the White House? Did you, did you inquire of Ms. Mills as to that? You know, I don't remember, Mr. Bennett. Uh, Mr. Ambrosio came to me shortly after his August 7th meeting with Mr. Buckland, and by the way, I think the clandestine taping reference was, was Mr. Buckland's. Uh, I expressed, uh, given my historical experience, a mild degree of skepticism that uh, any sort of clandestine uh, taping in the Oval Office had gone on, but instructed Mr. Ambrosio to do whatever was necessary to find out. I do not remember whether I mentioned that subject uh, to Mr. Mil Ms. Mills or not, because I uh, did discuss it with Mr. Brewer and Mr. Ambrosia. Hey, you basically cannot say that you did or did not, you just don't recall. I, I just don't have a recollection, Ms. Mills, my advice. Ms. Mills, do you recall whether Mr. Ruff broached the topic with you of a counsel for Senator Thompson's committee suggesting there might be clandestine taping at the White House? I do not recall that. Uh, do you, when you say you do not recall, is it your testimony that it did not occur, or you just can't say one way or the other? Um, I don't have a recollection of it occurring. And with respect to the uh, September 9th meeting, uh, Mr. Ruff, when there was apparently a discussion with staff from the Senate as to taping of political events, but not specifically coffees, did you at any time have any member of your staff contact any representatives of this committee with respect to the fact of political taping of any type, which you learned about on September the 9th? Let me be clear, Mr. Bennett, that my brief recitation of the chronology with respect to Mr. Ambrosio's meeting was largely a matter of having uh, heard his testimony on the subject and discussing it with him. I was not aware of the September 9th meeting, indeed, I think, until October 1st when I first learned of the existence of the tapes themselves. So there was really no 
predicate, I think, for uh, uh, the question of whether or not I would instruct somebody to raise it with uh, this committee. And with respect to the importance of that kind of uh, uh, topic, th th there was no point in time that you didn't ask Mr. Lindsay or Ms. Mills, based on their history during the first term of the President's administration, as to this whole matter of taping, to your recollection? No, I am certain I did not, and indeed, uh, I would only comment in that regard, Mr. Bennett, that uh, although legitimately so, the issue of videotaping has taken on a sort of life of its own in the last month, uh, the existence or non-existence of videotaping really was not uh, an issue that was, I think, high on anybody's screen here, other than, as a general matter, searching for all responsive documents, whatever form they took. Um. Mr. Ruff, let me ask you this. Uh, there was a meeting in your office on Friday morning, October the 3rd of 1997, this year, uh, when these videotapes had been discovered. Isn't that correct? That's correct. And uh, who was in attendance at that meeting? I don't remember who uh, all were there, but it was basically the investigative team in my office, which would have been uh, Mr. Brewer, Mr. Ambrosio, uh, and a variety of other lawyers who work on the investigative side the purpose being to uh, discuss where we stood on various uh, elements of document collection and production, and particularly the issue of the recently discovered videotapes. And uh, Mr. Ruff, Ms. Mills was present at that meeting as well, wasn't she? I believe so. Ms. Mills, were you present? Yes, I was. And at that point in time, was there any discussion by anyone of the fact that, that they knew that there had been, in fact, videotapes of political events before? Well, there was discussion of Mr. Ambrosius having found the initial evidence of videotaping, I recall no other discussion of the subject. Ms. Mills, did you at that point in time indicate to Mr. Ruff that uh, if you had known they wanted videotapes, that, uh, that you certainly could have let people know that there were videotapes? Did you express any surprise at this request? Um, I learned about this the morning of the 3rd, so I think as, as you might know from prior testimony of, my, of mine. So one of the things that I think was at issue at that time was that the taping was of coffees. I was quite surprised to learn that there were videotapes related to the coffees. Did you, um, what steps did you take over the weekend with respect to this matter? I tried to work with the staff and assist in any way that I could with regard to ensuring that all the appropriate materials were produced. Did you uh, contact uh, Mr. Steve Gooden? I'm sure I would have contacted Mr. Gooden prior to the time that we, we would have produced him because at that time we had understood that Mr. Gooden might have been one of the individuals who worked with WACA to apprise them of what events should and shouldn't be taped. Um, moving on to just the general topic, Mr. Ruff, of, of compliance. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield the, the balance of my time to another attorney on the staff of this committee and the subcommittee, Jay Apperson, uh, and I'd ask that Exhibit 146 be placed up on the screen. Mr. Apperson is recognized for the remainder of the time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Ruff, Ms. Mills, good afternoon. The subcommittee of this committee, chaired by Representative David McIntosh, has been tasked with conducting an investigation of the White House database, uh, which was planned and developed inside the Clinton White House with the use of taxpayer funds to the tune of $1 million plus dollars. The investigation includes the possible misuse of that database for partisan political purposes. The subject of our inquiry from the subcommittee standpoint today stems from a remarkable incident just last week. After being repeatedly assured that the requests for documents by the chairman and by the subcommittee had been complied with, we were sent a letter, as you know, Mr. Ruff, on the 28th of October, conveying additional documents. And we learned for the first time that those documents contained uh, some very important ones. Ones that had in fact been discovered, not in some dusty room of the basement of the White House, as you referenced in other instances in your opening statement, but had been discovered fully a year ago when they were first requested. And that someone in the White House had found those documents pursuant to the the subcommittee's request and pursuant to the directive from the council's office to find it and to give it to the council's office. And the record reflects that whoever that was in the White House in fact delivered it to the council's office for production to the Congress. This is an instance in which that document was then deliberately determined not 
to be provided to the Congress pursuant to its request, not by some low-level staffer, but by someone directly in the White House Counsel's Office. That person or other persons thereafter placed that responsive document in a file, and there it remained. Now, Mr. Ruff, on August 2, 1996, after repeated attempts to obtain cooperation and relevant evidence from your predecessor, Jack Quinn, the subcommittee sent a letter directly to the President, signed by all majority members of the subcommittee, requesting all documents and materials related to the White House database known as HUDB. The subcommittee had been led to believe after that that the relevant documents pursuant to that request had in fact been produced. Now I've noted your letter of just last week conveying additional documents. And that's what I want to talk about. Among these documents... Well, point of uh, inquiry, Mr. Chairman, are we... Uh, the gentleman will state his point. Are we in the process of questions, or are we now in a, 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 a monologue? Are we getting to a question? The, the council uh, has the time as, uh, as requested and agreed to, and I'm sure it will uh, result in questions. I think he's setting the stage for his questions. The gentleman will proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, on the screen is the pertinent portion of the request from the subcommittee. Mr. Jefferson, may I ask what exhibit you're looking to? It's it, very difficult to it's read. It's right on the screen. You have it in a separate notebook, uh, noticed as White House database information, and you will find that as exhibit number three, sir. Mr. The Chair. attachment to that request is very specific and sets forth, requires response from the White House to furnish documents for all communications concerning the HUDB including and involving the White House, its employees, internal communications, notes, et cetera. Now, produced along with your letter was a handwritten notation, and I will ask that that be put up now as C-64. Gentleman will suspend. Gentleman will state his parliamentary inquiry. Before we get to the next one, I, again, I'm, I'm having difficulty, and it may be that, that we do have the documents. I have here exhibit C-65 which is the prior screen. And it has obviously this material that's been taken out and highlighted. Everything else on the page I'm unable to read. The, if the, I may, Mr. Chairman, it will be found in the in members uh, books as exhibit 147. 147. That's you refer to that exactly then when you, when you have an exhibit up there. I will attempt you to do please so, do that? Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask a brief question, Mr. Mr. Chairman? Is this uh, line of questioning related to our investigation of Chinese influence in the 96 election? It's related to the investigation by this full committee and the subcommittee chaired by Mr. McIntosh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, parliamentary inquiry. The gentleman yeah. will state it. Um, the, the council's time isn't being docked for all of these it inquiries, is, not. is it? It is not. We're Great. giving them Thank you. time. Thank uh, you. Add an additional minute and a half to two minutes on that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Roth. That document, and I know you're familiar with it because it was a number of a very few documents which were sent accompanying your letter, is a handwritten note, a single page, that references and provides evidence that Harold Ickes, who was then Deputy Chief of Staff to the President, and Deborah DeLee, Executive Director of the Democrat National Committee, wanted to assure that the HUDB, the White House database, is integrated with the DNC database so that each can share the information. The, inf the, the handwritten notations further reflect that evidently POTUS, President of the United States, wants this done. It further talks about the desire on the part of Mr. Ickes for a meeting to take place to further this plan. And it talks further that Bobby Watson, Deborah's ass assistant, uh, DeLee's assistant at the DNC, is working on that very plan at their end, i.e. at the DNC. You can imagine that after a year, we were quite uh, interested to receive this document. Now, in your letter of October 28th conveying the document, well over a year, you stated, quote, certain of these documents accompanying your letter are arguably not responsive. Mr. Ruff, I want to ask you directly, with respect to this document, these handwritten notations, which set forth a plan by persons in the highest level of the White House and at the DNC to share prohibitive data from the White House database, 
do you consider that relevant to the, to the request from this subcommittee in August of 1996? Uh, Mr. Everson, I don't want to be impolite, but I will uh, avoid, I think, uh, trying to uh, parse line by line the introduction to that question uh, and uh, because I disagree with uh, at least many of the implications that it contained. My view of this document is that it was clearly something that we should produce to the subcommittee as soon as we found it, which we did. We have taken the view in the months since Congressman McIntosh and I exchanged what seemed to be an endless number of letters, uh, before I, some before and some after I took office. Uh, and I told him that my view of this process was with all respect, Mr. Ruff, I, I appreciate your views of the process. My question is... I, I am, I'm, attempting to, to I'm attempting to answer your question, Mr. Jefferson. And the question is, is this document responsive to the if, August If you'll permit letter? me, I, I, will. I will try to make my answer shorter than the introduction. The... Yes, yeah. Uh, uh, I, appreciate, I didn't know the beepers could be controlled, but I appreciate it. Uh, my view has been since the early months of this year and is reflected in my discussion and my correspondence with uh, Chairman McIntosh uh, that we would break through the impasse that had developed previous to that. We have produced uh, documents erring on the side of responsiveness without worrying candidly about uh, find questions about whether or not they fit exactly within a particular description. I will not, I, I think, venture to go back into uh, even the modestly dim myths of history and make a judgment about where this document fit into the sequence of events. I made the decision on production on October 28th because there was no question in my mind that it was directly relevant to the chairman's concerns committee's investigation, subcommittee's investigation, and there was clearly no reluctance on our part to produce it at that time. Well, Mr. Ruff, a year before, well over a year before, mm -hmm. there was more than a reluctance on the part of someone in your office to, do, to make that exact decision. Mr. Epperson, and my I'll question to you yes. is, who in 1996 in the White House Counsel's office made the decision to withhold that document? Mr. Epperson, obviously I was not there at the time, so what I'm about to tell you is a reconstruction of events uh, that led up to my letter of October 28th to uh, to Chairman McIntosh. Uh, as I understand the situation last fall, there were a number of lawyers working uh, to collect documents responsive to the Hootie B request. Ultimately, as I understand it, uh, the decisions about uh, responsiveness were made by my predecessor, Mr. Quinn, who, as is my practice, uh, reviews these closed questions uh, whenever they arise. Sir, if I makes may, an ultimate judgment are you about testifying that Mr. Quinn made the decision I, I, not, I, to, excuse me, yeah. not to produce this document? I can't, obviously cannot tell you as to each document who made which decision because I was not there. Have you asked the people in the White House Counsel's Office the question I'm asking you now? No, I have not, but may I suggest... Can we allow a witness I, to answer I, the question? May I suggest that my colleague's recommendation that since she was there at the time. She may be able to shed some light. Ms. Mills, I appreciate it. Ms. Mills, do you know about this? Yes, at that okay. time. Let me, let me ask a question of you then. Who made the decision in the White House Counsel's Office in 1996 not to produce this document, which had been provided to you pursuant to the, to the request of the committee for production? Who made the decision in 96 not to give it to Congress? Well, setting aside your premise, because actually this was one of the materials that were found by the Counsel's Office in going through archive materials, um, this when? document... This back in September. Oh, Mr. What Chairman, year? can we allow the witness okay. to answer the question? Let her answer the question. Thank you. What, what year? In 1996, as I don't know if you were familiar with the database production at that time, but uh, Mr. McIntosh at that time was seeking seven itemized um, materials related to the database. And in, that, in connection with that, we sent out a directive on the 12th of September. On the 18th of September, when documents to be returned, Mr. McIntosh uh, determined that he needed those documents that day. 
we began production at that time. We completed production within four Mr. days. Mr. Chairman, the witness is answering documents. the question as to Mr. who Mr. Chairman, let her answer the, the decision. Question, please. I completed unanimous consent for additional time if she's going to stop the wall and not answer the I question object. as to Let's who made the decision. The, the, I have no objection to you having time, but okay. I think we should allow the witness Great. to the, answer the, a question if we the, want to know the truth. The, the, Great. The, the and I, that's all I ask for is time. I realize that Mr. McIntosh is upset that he can't control the witness's answer, but if she could be about to continue. The gentlelady will have time to answer the question and will allow. The, the continuance to get to the conclusion of this. We have, we have 10 minutes. Go ahead. At that time, we reviewed all of the materials and produced them to you. At that time, this is, this is a part of materials that I reviewed and then reviewed with Mr. Quinn and made the determination that these materials were not responsive to the seven enumerated items that you all had listed in the August 2nd directive. So your testimony is that you looked at this document, which reflected HUDB in bold letters at the top line of that document and reflects people at the highest levels of the White House and the DNC sharing databases, and you determined it was not responsive to a request for HUDB material? Actually, I think correct? you probably are familiar with the directive. It actually asks for seven enumerated things, so it doesn't ask for all documents related to HUDB. But setting that aside, I can't go back and recreate for you at this time what information I had that led us to conclude that this material was not responsive to any of the seven enumerated items. But at that time, we sat down, we looked at these documents, I reviewed them with Mr. Quinn and ultimately made the determination that those materials did not fall within the scope of the materials that were requested. Did As you, you likely are probably aware, there were many documents of a similar type to this that we produced that are equally um, provide the same information with respect to uh, the desire by many of the staff members to ensure that there were uh, supporters of the president included in the database so that they might have an opportunity to invite and include them in events. The president and first lady also were obviously interested in ensuring that they could have a database that would provide them with an opportunity to include supporters at events. Okay, and that is something that, that the, the, the gentleman's time has expired. Uh, the chair will stand in recess. And when we return, the minority will have their half hour. gentleman from California is recognized uh, for 30 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In my opening well, statement, I, I agreed that uh, Mr. Ruff would have one minute to respond uh, to some comments that were made earlier. So, Mr. Ruff, you want to be recognized, and we'll go to Mr. Waxman. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Waxman, and, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in your opening uh, statement, Mr. Chairman, you raised a question about the importance of communications with the leaders of the uh, People's Republic of China concerning cooperation in this committee's and other investigations. And I, I just wanted to uh, inform uh, the chair that indeed uh, this very issue of cooperation in the investigation, of course, had been raised previously by both the Vice President and the Secretary of State during their visits to Beijing. But more importantly for today's purposes, uh, this was an issue uh, that is the importance of cooperation with your investigation and others that was raised directly by the President uh, with the President of the uh, People's Republic uh, during his recent visit and that the administration intends to continue to press for further cooperation 
by the Chinese government in these matters, and I just wanted to put that on the record. Just for clarification, did the President specifically ask that Charlie Tree be returned to the United States for questioning? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I am not familiar with the details of the conversation, but I'm advised that he did specifically raise and press for full cooperation in all aspects of your and other investigations. But you don't know about Charlie Tree? I, I do not, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Waxman. In my opening statement, uh, I noted that this hearing, like the first and only other campaign finance hearing we've held, duplicates hearings held in the Senate. And if this committee is going to investigate campaign finance issues, it should look into matters not previously investigated by the Senate, such as the activities of nonprofit groups like the Triad Management. I do not uh, want my skepticism about this hearing, however, to be construed as an endorsement of the White House's actions. The presidency is the highest office in our country. Those who serve in the White House should be held to high standards. It is reasonable to expect the White House to comply fully and promptly to all reasonable congressional requests for information, including requests for di videotapes of political coffees. Mr. Ruff, you testified that, and I want to quote, our efforts have been diligent and our compliance exemplary, end quote. I do not doubt that your efforts may have been diligent. You have a small staff of talented lawyers who have been working very hard. But I would not call the failure to discover the videotapes exemplary. In fact, it was, it was extremely, I was extremely disappointed when I learned that it had taken the White House so many months to produce the videotapes. In a word, I think it's inexcusable. In a sense, Mr. Madigan, the Senate counsel, captured some of my thoughts when he asked you about a series of questions about Starbucks. And if I may, I'd like to replay a portion of that Senate hearing, and you can uh, see it on the monitor in front of you. It'd be helpful if we had sound. <laughs> <laughs> Another committee's jurisdiction. <laughs> uh, the gentleman, this will not be counted against the gentleman's time. You keep it for the The only thing worse than this is when the Super Bowl goes silent. We have, an, we have an hour, I've been informed. Well, thank God they don't have the Super Bowl repeated as we have these hearings repeated. Hmm. While we're waiting for the sound, I would just like to maybe make one real brief response to my colleague from California. Uh, it's my understanding Ms. Mills did not testify before the Senate, so that is... Uh, some new information for our investigation. A new witness, I don't know about new information. Does anybody know the comment? Well, while we're waiting just for the record, uh, both Lanny Brewer and Mr. Ruff testified in the Senate, and Ms. Mills gave them a deposition in the Senate, but did not correct. testify. That's correct. Okay. Uh, would it be possible, Mr. Waxman, for you to uh, come back to this part of your testimony or your statement? Or would you rather? Uh, we can't master the technology to run a videotape with sound. You turn it louder. <laughs> if you've got the video, it's running. So therefore, the sound audio has to be turned up. I may, I may remember what I said. Uh, that would be <laughs> Mr. Chairman, have you hired lip readers? Let me see. <laughs> Let me think about that.
Well, I would have liked everyone to have seen this videotape because it encompassed some of the very same questions that have been asked already. And in that uh, videotape, Mr. Ruff, since it was a questioning of you, yes. you were asked uh, whether you would go to the president or the CEO of a company uh, if, uh, if you were trying to get uh, information to comply with a request for information. And as I understand your answer, you said you would not. I think the way it played out was this, uh, Congressman Waxman. Uh, Mr. Madigan was uh, pressing uh, to learn how we go about checking to make sure that we've got everything that's responsive. And we, of course, had uh, talked about sending the directive out to, uh, uh, to WACA. And then uh, he, he asked and me Walker something. is the White House? White House Communications Agency, which did the taping. And of course, the story of how we lost the relevant page has often been told. Uh, he then asked, uh, well, did you go uh, to see the president? And I think my response was something along the lines of, uh, if you were conducting a document search in Starbucks, you wouldn't go talk to the CEO about where those documents were. I think that was the exchange to which you have reference. And with that kind of an answer, I presume that when you start a document search, uh, you don't go to the President of the United States because you'd be taking up his time on every request for information. I, I think that's a fair assessment, yeah. Uh, what, but what I don't fully understand is why you or your staff didn't talk with enough people close to the President to know that the coffees had been videotaped. Can you explain why you didn't learn about the videotapes earlier? Well, I, I think it's difficult to look back over the last several months and uh, respond to that question simply because the videotapes have taken on such an enormous aspect in the last uh, month or so, and quite rightly, uh, uh, they have. Uh, when we send out uh, a directive asking for information in all its forms, computerized and every other, and we get back a specific response from the agency involved, as we did in this case, as we do from all the people to whom we send this directive. And we get computerized information and photographs and emails and everything else. We have no reason at that point to pick out the videotape process or the coffees as a special item for inquiry. And we didn't really have that until August when Mr. Ambrosio began his inquiry into the matter. You sent out a directive uh, to the White House Communications Agency requesting information that would have included videotapes? We, we sent the, uh, the directive of April 28th to all the key agencies, including the White House Military Office, which is the parent agency of the White House Communications Agency. And as you know from the testimony, Congressman Waxman, they in turn sent that directive to WACA, and one page didn't make it off the fax machine. Well, Mr. Ruff, uh I want to tell you that I would have hoped you would have done more than this to find the tapes. And I wish that you had asked people who participated in the coffees what kind of information existed ab about those coffees. And perhaps if you had taken a more active approach, you would have learned about the videotapes earlier. This could have saved you, the president, and everybody uh, in general a lot of embarrassment. I, I, will, I will second your wish uh, that I had done uh, just that, if only to have avoided the last five weeks of, uh, of turmoil. Well, for the um, reasons I indicated to you, I wish you had done a better job locating the videotapes. Thus, I'm critical of your efforts, somewhat critical of your But there is a big difference between making a mistake and deliberately trying to obstruct the congressional investigation or deliberately tampering with the evidence. The chairman and other Republican members of the committee have gone much further in their criticism than I have. The chairman said on national television that he thought the tapes have been intentionally cut off and altered. This would have been a deliberate obstruction of justice. Other Republican members have also raised allegations of obstruction of justice. In fact, Mr. Barr, a member of this committee, sent around a letter to me and other members of the House this week that said articles of impeachment should be filed against the President. Now, these are very serious charges. If they are true, there should be serious consequences for the White House.
but if they are false or unsubstantiated, they represent partisanship at its worst. Serious investigators don't throw around unsubstantiated charges, but those conducting a partisan witch hunt do. Now, this uh, issue of obstruction of justice was addressed in the Senate, and we have another videotape, and I want to see if uh, the sound is working so we can uh, show that videotape. That's, uh, that was an inquiry by Mr. Barron, the minority counsel, where I thought he cut right to the issue. Uh, uh, so anybody contacted Representative Ross Leighton to see if we could get the sound working, because she was very successful last week or so. <laughs> We have a technician that's on its way on his way to uh, get to this. So I apologize once again. I don't know what happened. Somebody must have kicked a wire loose or something. Well, let me uh, read from the testimony in the Senate. Mr. Barron, Mr. Am Ambrosio, have you ever been told or has it ever been suggested to you directly or indirectly or some implicit way to conceal a document or any other material from being produced? And Mr. Ambrosio. 100% absolutely not. Mr. Barron, are you aware of anybody else within the White House attempting to conceal or fail to produce a document that was responsive to a request? Mr. Ambrosio, certainly not. And if I were, I would probably go immediately to Mr. Ruff. Mr. Barron, with regard to the videotapes, are you aware of anybody attempting to conceal, alter, or in any way hinder the protection of the videotapes? Mr. Ambrosio, certainly not. Those were the statements given under oath before the Senate uh, committee. The, um, Mr. Ruff, I'd like to ask you the same question that Mr. Barron asked one of your lawyers. First, have you been, ever been told, or has it ever been suggested to you, directly or indirectly, or in some implicit way, to conceal a document or any other material from being produced? I can't say it better than Mike Ambrosio did 100%, absolutely not. Are you aware of anybody else within the White House attempting to conceal or fail to produce a document that was responsive to a request? Absolutely not. With regard to the videotapes, are you aware of anybody attempting to conceal, alter, or in any way hinder the production of the videotapes? I am not. Mr. Ruff, are you aware that this committee has taken the deposition of Colonel Joseph Simmons, the commander of the White House Communications Agency, mm -hmm. Colonel Alan Simmons, who heads the White House Military Office, which oversees the White House Communications Agency, and Stephen Smith, the Chief of Operations of the White House Communications Agency. I'm aware their depositions were taken, yes, sir. Now, each of these witnesses are nonpartisan White House employees. They have distinguished military records. They are all in the chain of command responsible for those videotapes. Each of them was asked whether they were aware of any evidence of tampering or altering those tapes. And do you know what they told this committee? I know only in summary that they absolutely denied any knowledge of such tampering. They all testified under oath that there was no alteration of those videotapes. Mr. Chairman, I wrote to you a letter last week asking you to substantiate your accusations of tampering. And I said that you should either come forward with evidence supporting these accusations, or you should apologize to the President, uh, Mr. Ruff, and to everyone else responsible for the tapes at the White House. Unfortunately, you didn't respond to uh, that letter. But in light of the testimony in the Senate given under oath by people who are not even partisans that work at the White House and the testimony we've received today, I'd like to yield to you if you want to retract that uh, accusation. The gentleman will yield. Uh, the Justice Department, the Senate uh, committee, and our committee is uh, uh, going to be uh, examining the tapes if it hasn't been done already by uh, expert technicians uh, to make sure that uh, the tapes uh, were intact and were not at all altered in any way. Uh, what I said on national television, I believe it was on Face the Nation, was I thought that there was a, a real possibility that they may have been altered. I, na I made no categorical statement that they were altered. On, on what basis did you think there was a real possibility that they had been altered? I, I'll be glad to restate what I said uh, on Face the Nation. Well, I heard what you said. I'll well, In I'll fact, we even had the videotape, but we wouldn't get the sound from that one either. <laughs> well, I can, I can well, What you said that. is there may have been alteration of those tapes. You made that statement. Did you have any basis for it? But the basis that we had uh, was that uh, there were interruptions, there were tapes that had no sound, 
uh, there were uh, uh, tapes that were uh, broken in the middle and, uh, and uh, uh, information that may have been relevant was left out. And we wanted to find out, and we are trying to find out, if that was a deliberate uh, uh, attempt to keep uh, information from the committee or if it wasn't. But the fact of the matter is we're investigating that right now, and if we find uh, no, uh, no uh, attempt to alter the tapes, then that we will so state. Well, the only thing I can say, there was a Mr. Ginsburg also testified in the Senate who said that there was no alteration of the tapes. Uh, I, if the gentleman would yield, I believe, they said I'm going to, uh, I believe they said to the best of their knowledge. Well, I'm reclaiming my time. To the best of your knowledge, Mr. Chairman, you had no evidence. You were making a guess, and when you make a guess and you're the man leading the investigation, that is what ends up on the headline the next day. And uh, often the truth never catches up with the accusation. Uh, and I think that that's not a responsible way for an investigative committee to be proceeding. Now, we have additional time, and I want to yield to uh, members of the committee, uh, and I uh, uh, promise that um, I would yield uh, to um, uh, Mr. Well, Mr. Sanders, I know I had promised, so let me yield to him a, a minute or two, and then we'll see if we can have time for others. Very briefly. Mr. Chairman, and I will get into a greater discussion later on. It, it seems to me that one of the problems that we've had in these whole hearings is that the focus of attention has only been on the White House. Now, I think we should probe as deeply as we can all of the problems, and there are many associated with the President's fundraising. No argument from me. But I think that the reason that these hearings have not captured the interest of the American people is there is nobody in America, maybe with the exception of a few people on that side of the aisle, who think that campaign finance problems are limited to the White House. Let me quote, if I might, didn't have to go very far, today's newspaper, USA Today, quote, national Republican organizations sank $5 million into their sweep of Tuesday's elections in, the, in New York, New Jersey, and Virginia, uh, more than five times what Democrats invested. Next article, today's papers, Wall Street Journal, quote, after months of intra-party second-guessing, Tuesday's elections became a triumph to gladden Republican hearts and perhaps also to stiffen their spines against the prospect of sweeping campaign finance overhaul, end of quote. In other words, they raised five times more money, they won the elections, and they're saying, hey, who needs campaign finance reform? Mr. Chairman, I would hope very much uh, that we might hold uh, some hearings on, the, on that issue. And the second uh, point that I would like to make with that regard is in an article in Roll Call October 30th, just last week. The thrust of the article is that Democrats are very upset because corporate America, the largest corporations in this country, are contributing more money to the Republican Party than they are to the Democratic Party. It's a great concern to the Democrats. AT&T, American International Group, Anheuser-Busch, putting millions of dollars in soft money and the Democrats are upset the Republicans are getting more. Now, I would hope very much that we could have a hearing, which I think really would capture the attention of the American people. If we brought corporate America in here and we asked them why they are contributing millions of dollars to both political parties and what they expect to get from that. It is no secret that the rich get richer, the middle class is shrinking, working people have seen a decline in their standard of living, and I think the American people understand that that is directly related to the role that corporate America and big money have on campaign finance. Thank if you, Mr. Uh, Sanders. I want to yield to some of the sure. other Thank you, Mr. I thought you had some, some good points. Uh, Mr. Lantos, two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me first uh, commend Mr. Ruff and Ms. Mills for an outstanding job conducted in a most professional manner. We don't know each other. This is the first time in my life I've seen you. But on behalf of the committee, I want to express our apologies to you because you have been harassed incessantly and in an utterly irresponsible fashion. And as one member of this committee, I want you to know how sorry I am and, uh, and how fully you do not deserve this. Now, I want to uh, bring a bit of reality check to this hearing because to call this uh, trivial pursuit 
is an insult to other trivial pursuits. This is much worse than that. This is a reckless and irresponsible and hypocritical attempt to create an impression that highly professional and dedicated public servants who have been doing their jobs have somehow illegally attempted to confuse and cloud and obfuscate an issue. I would like to um, remind our members that 10 years ago this week, in November of 1987, at the conclusion of the Iran-Contra hearings, some of the most respected members of this body, some of them no longer alive, future Speaker of the House Tom Foley, future Secretary of Defense at that time Les Aspen, Chairman of the House Judiciary Committee during the Watergate hearings Peter Rodino, uh, issued a report concerning the Reagan White House's non-compliance with respect with requests. I want to read just one paragraph. Because of President Reagan's personal promise that the executive branch would fully cooperate with the committees in their investigation, the committees did not issue subpoenas to any person or agency of the executive branch. However, the White House and a number of executive agencies either belatedly produced or withheld information requested by the committees. This delayed production, non-production, and non-compliance with committee requests made witness interviews difficult, made it necessary that some witnesses be re-interviewed, and complicated the committee's preparation for public hearings. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent that uh, this report be made part of the record. Without objection. Now, um, it's important for us who are so self-absorbed in our own importance in this particular trivial pursuit to recognize that there is a whole world out there. Southeast Asian economies are crumbling. Iraq is preparing weapons of mass destruction. There is a new palace revolution within the Kremlin. And as we speak, six million political prisoners in China are suffering fate that most people in this country cannot even comprehend. So I would like to call on you, Mr. Chairman, to follow the example of Senator Thompson, who recognized that there is nothing there, threw in the towel, and called off the investigation. What we are witnessing is an irresponsible and reckless partisan political theater of the absurd, with self-righteousness oozing, oozing from, from the pores of this committee at a time when the country is, in fact, in need of dealing with serious domestic and international issues. Last night, um, as we were here until past 11 voting, some of us went into the cloakroom and watch, uh, watched Ken Burns' masterpiece, the Lewis and Clark Expedition. And it sort of restored one's faith in both the past and the future of this country. But frankly, I couldn't care less whether these breathless movies showing sweet and low being put into a coffee uh, at, a, at a White House uh, gathering, whether it is released Tuesday or Wednesday or next Friday afternoon. And this pathetic attempt to make it appear that we are dealing with issues of major import, matters of deep concern for the United States, when military officers are testifying that Nobody altered these films, that mistakes were made in releasing them late. Never having made a mistake in my life, I really have no sympathy for people who make mistakes in the White House or elsewhere. But I just think it's important to, to wake up 
and, uh, and realize that there are real issues to be dealt with. And this trivial pursuit needs to come to an end. Campaign fundraising reform is long overdue. The Republicans are as guilty as the Democrats of historic mistakes. And we better move on to some real issues. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Lantos. Mr. Kenjorski. Thank you very much, Waxman. Uh, just as a point, I think we've all seen, uh, uh, in Pennsylvania, we think of Monday morning quarterbacking. Uh, and of course, we all can outguess Joe Paterno, particularly if he loses. It seems to me that we've had a perfect example here today where even the simplest of modern technology goofs up on three occasions. We were incapable of providing just the sound to evidential documents that were wanted to be presented to uh, the witnesses and the committee. And I, I have not heard a cry for an investigation of uh, miscarriage of justice or an attempt to avoid uh, proper pursuits of the same. Uh, I, I, I think that uh, Mr. Lantos has uh, adequately summed up uh, what we're all about or should be about. But Mr. Huff, I would like to uh, follow through, particularly on this question of the tapes. As I understand it, I want to make sure the American people that are watching this, uh, the explanation is that there was not a protocol until April 10th of this year in which any documents were supplied by the White House to this committee. Is that correct? There were some documents supplied before that time, but not really in any flow until we had that arrangement with the committee. That's correct. All right. And, that, and the protocol that we would be talking about, so the average American out there, is the system or process under which it would operate. That's there correct. There was an understanding of protection of security, so the documents wouldn't be misused, abused, or inadvertently leaked or intentionally leaked. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. So we're, we're dealing with a period that moves from April when those documents were begun to release. And as I understand it, the White House encompasses about 19 offices in the executive office of the White House. Is that correct? Actually, more offices than that, uh, uh, depending on how you count, in the neighborhood of 40. Well, what, what now is the breakdown? I think when I was chair of the committee that had jurisdiction of the White House, we had about 19. Mm -hmm. You have to about 22 or 23 now? Uh, more than that, actually. Oh, okay. And, and as I understand it, there are more than 2,500 employees engaged that, in that's various correct. pursuits. That's correct. And as I understand it, and I'm being facetious, you were given $6 million in the council's office to respond. We, we appropriated that money, didn't we? I know the chairman. I've, wanted I've been fair. searching for the $6 million. I'm sure it's there somewhere. In reality, you have chief counsel, the president, yourself. You have a deputy and several assistants, four or five assistants. And we have a total of 17 lawyers, about half of whom work on non-investigative matters, the real business of the office. And the Congress has not seen fit to give you additional appropriations so that you could increase that staff, even though you have three intensive examinations going on one by the Senate, one by the House Committee that we're at now, and the Justice Department. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. And in the course of this period of time, <clears throat> is it correct that you've had over 300 subpoenas to respond to? We've had 300 requests or so from this committee alone, plus about the same from the Senate and several hundred from other bodies. Okay, so we're talking about a receipt of maybe seven to eight subpoenas per working day since April. Well, I haven't tried the division, but certainly if you divide the 1,100 or so requests we've gotten into the intervening days, certainly on work days, that's correct. And I understand to this committee alone, you've provided <clears throat> us with more than 110,000 documents. That's correct. All of which had to be found, read, determined whether or not they violated national security or were subject to executive privilege. That's correct, Kanjorski. Mr. Kanjorski, will you yield to me just to make one point sure. here? You have 17 people? We have 17 lawyers total, uh, uh, Congressman Waxman, uh, Ms. Ms. Mills, myself, and Mr. Lindsay, the three uh, headquarters lawyers. And then uh, we have about uh, half our lawyers who work on investigations, about seven, and another seven who work on non-investigative matters. In this committee alone, we have 60 people investigating you. I, I would have guessed more, given the uh, uh, the presence, but I'll uh, I'll 
take your word for it. Some, sometimes they ask the same questions over again. And I must say, with 60 people working on the investigation in this committee, it hasn't been a model of efficiency. Well, let's attack just that. This committee has already issued six subpoenas to misidentified Americans that had nothing to do or not intended to be subpoenaed. We brought the bank records in of people, examined their bank records, when we absolutely, they had no relationship with us. So with our 60 employees and all our lawyers and all the coordination between the House and the Senate side and whoever else, and I think there are probably some nonprofit organizations out there that are even providing soft support, they have made significant errors that could border if you are not fair-minded to say men make mistakes and sometimes things don't pursue a degree of incompetence. As a matter of fact, if I recall, about two months ago, there was a chief counsel of the majority side, the side that resigned because of incompetence and political uh, activity on the part of the majority. Have you had any of your attorneys at the White House resigned because they felt you were politicizing or that the office was acting in an incompetent manner? No, sir. Mr. Uh, Kondrowski, I'm going to yield uh, yes. some time to Mr. Fatar, who's been here as well. Then we'll have more chance to go back and forth after the... Uh, certainly. Mr. Thank Fattar. you, Mr. Uh, let me thank uh, the ranking member. And uh, I guess I really want to get at two issues as quickly as I can and as concisely as I can. The, the, the president is at, on one hand, the most successful politician of his generation and the most successful Democrat uh, in at least two, maybe three decades, uh, having won the White House twice. So on one hand, we have a very successful politician. On the other hand, as best as I can determine it, between Whitewater and Foggate and Travelgate and uh, now the campaign finance uh, investigation, he is also with somewhere around 55 million or so being spent on investigating uh, his uh, activities, uh, the most investigated person ever in the history of this country. Would that be a correct statement, Mr. Ruff? I'm not sure that my history is good enough, but certainly there are more investigations than uh, one would care to contemplate. Well, what I mean is by the most investigated, I mean that, there, that no one has ever had that much resources spent analyzing, investigating, uh, his every activity, meeting, phone call, uh, his wife's activities, uh, even down to Socks the Cat, I think there have been um, allegations of uh, some type of wrongdoing. And through it all, um, there's not been anything that has come of these investigations. And the Senate, after spending millions of dollars, has concluded its campaign finance investigation. Uh, and today we spent a long time talking about videotapes, the suggestion being that there was an obstruction of justice. And the reality is that there's nothing on the videotapes that is incriminating in any way, shape, or form as best as I've been able to determine. Do you have some contrary determination about that? I think uh, uh, quite so, uh, uh, Congressman Fatah. The videotapes are, of the coffees are entirely consistent with the descriptions previously given of those events and certainly reveal no improper activity. So you've been brought over here with your deputy to be questioned about obstructing the delivery of incriminating evidence, supposedly, which is not incriminating at all. I think that's fair. Now, there was a election that took place in 1996 and uh, one that took place in 1992, and, and I think that maybe the biggest offense of Bill Clinton is that he beat the Republicans. But there's a, the, the, another point I'd like to make about those elections is that um, there were some similarities between the two campaigns, the Republican Party's campaign, Democratic Party's campaign. Both campaigns used soft money for issue advocacy and other purposes. And both campaigns received foreign contributions that they had to return um, in, the, in the millions of dollars. Uh, and there's some differences in these two campaigns. The Dole campaign is the only one of the two in which there have now been two criminal, successful criminal prosecutions. One of a campaign chair who uh, was fined uh, some six or eight million dollars, I can't recall, and uh, put under house arrest for laundering money through a Hong Kong bank. And 
we now have a Pennsylvania company that has pled guilty to a conduit of uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars into the uh, Republican campaign coffers. There's been, to your knowledge, any successful prosecution of any official in the Clinton campaign having to do with conduit payments? No, sir. Have there been any charges made, specific criminal charges, to your knowledge, of the president or anyone else of being involved in uh, criminal activity, conduit campaign not contributions? To, not to my knowledge, Congressman. So there's a distinction between these two campaigns in that one has been burdened by uh, successful prosecutions of illegalities. And the other, at best, what we've had is a Senate investigation which is concluded with nothing but thin air. And I think that it's important as we deal with this issue uh, that we try to put this into some perspective because I assume your office has other responsibilities as the counsel to the White House. I like to think so, Congressman, yes. Would you, I, I, I have no idea since I'm not a lawyer and I've never worked in the White House counsel's office, would you just, in a bullet form, tell us about some of the other responsibilities that you have as counsel to the White House? Well, my principal responsibility, of course, is to try to advise the President on a whole range of legal matters arising out of legislation, the work of this body and others. We are responsible for advising the President concerning the selection of judges, certainly one of the most important functions the President has. We serve as ethics counsel uh, to all White House employees. I would assume that there's some national security issues that you have to deal with. We, we together with the National Security Council legal advisors, work on a number of those matters. Well, let me just conclude, because I know the, chair, the ranking member has a limited amount of time. But the real crime that may have been committed is that this White House, this administration, notwithstanding its political success, has been burdened, as you have uh, already illustrated, uh, by a whole range of investigations. My colleague, Mr. Kandrosi, said, well, we have one investigation here in the House. There are other committees in the House that are issuing subpoenas and making uh, requests uh, around other matters. And I, I remember the Speaker saying that once the Republicans took over, they were going to have every committee of the Congress be an investigatory committee, and they would have subpoenas flying all over the place. I think that one possibility is that the biggest crime that's being committed here is that this administration is, even though elected by the people of this country twice now, is being impeded from carrying out its policy uh, objectives by this continuing assault with, and after all of it, after tens of millions of dollars being spent, no one has even come close to uh, uh, being able to bring any type of, of uh, a criminal activity or e improper activity upon the president or saying that he had any knowledge thereof. So I want to thank you for your appearance here, and I want to thank the ranking member for yielding to me. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, I would like to just make a couple of clarifying comments before I yield to uh, Mr. McIntosh for his 10 minutes. First of all, uh, Senator Thompson <clears throat> wanted more time. In fact, I think he said when he concluded his hearings that, uh, in effect, the White House had run out the clock. and He thought setting time constraints on him uh, was probably, in retrospect, the wrong thing to do because they had a lot more they had to look into. Uh, secondly, uh, it was two and not six people where we got erroneous, uh, where we sent erroneous subpoenas. Those records that we received were returned without us reviewing them. Uh, obviously, when you send out three or four hundred subpoenas, sometimes uh, there is a mistake made, but we made sure that they were not violated in any way because those records were returned without review. Uh, finally, uh, there are 62 plus people. Uh, that we've been uh, uh, investigating and asking for information on on the Democrat side that have taken the Fifth Amendment or fled the country. None on, none on the Republican side. Well, I gave you extra time. None on the Republican side. And that is the reason why the preponderance of the investigation has been on the Democrat side. That's not to say that we're not going to investigate Republican uh, alleged illegal activity, because we are. But when you have 62 people taking the Fifth Amendment or fleeing the country, then you have to look into that and none on the Republican side. And finally, I want to ask Mr. Ruff one real quick question. Yes, Has anybody on my staff on the majority side harassed you in any way? Mr. Chairman, we are engaged, I believe, in good, hard-fought, occasionally, professional dealings with you and your staff. 
as I indicated at the beginning of my comments today, I've always appreciated the candor with which you and I have dealt with each other, and I appreciate the candor with which Mr. Bennett and I deal with each other. We do not uh, always agree, sometimes almost, almost never agree, but uh, I have always felt our relationships to be professional. I feel burdened because you've asked for a lot of stuff from us, but our relations, as I said, I've viewed as professional, occasionally contentious, but professional. But not harassed? No, sir. Mr. McIntosh. Mr. Chairman, let me start with the inquiry. Do you, do you want to stop for the vote first? If you would you like, Mr. McIntosh, time? we can break for the vote and come back and then you can start fresh when we come We've back. We've got 10. I'm happy to do it. You want to do it right yeah. now? Okay, we have the time. But, uh, good afternoon, Mr. Ruff and Ms. Good Mills. Afternoon. Let me pick up where we left off on the WhoDB questioning. Mm -hmm. And Ms. Mills, in addition to you and Mr. Quinn, were there any other individuals who were involved in the decision to withhold the handwritten notes and the other documents uh, in the fall of 96? In the fall of 96, given the short time frame in which we had to, had to review the materials, we went about asking those members of our office who had time that weekend to come in to help go through all the different materials that had been collected. I couldn't tell you how many of those different people might have had occasion to review this document. Um, but what we did try and do once we got to this particular document and some others is review them carefully and make a determination based on the criteria that you had outlined that you were looking for and make a determination regarding its responsiveness. Okay. And do you recall which, which weekend that was? Um, I believe, actually, we sent out our request on the 12th. I believe on the 18th is when you, we had our directive re, uh, return date for the document, so we had a very quick turnaround for the return date. I believe it was on the 18th or 19th that you sought the materials from us and we started producing them around that time. That's my best recollection. Okay. And w was that decision ever revisited? The decision to produce documents to you? Uh, the particular ones that we were talking about earlier, the handwritten memo and, and the other documents that Mr. Ruff said. We, they were placed in a file, and at the time when I concluded handling this matter, I transferred them to another attorney who was handling them. I don't believe she had occasion to re-review those materials until sometime recently in response to additional requests that you've been posing. And you and Mr. Quinn didn't revisit that decision? At that time, we didn't revisit because we didn't have any new requests from you. That's correct. Um, well, let me point out we had an outstanding request for all of the documents. Um, let me ask you about some individuals to see if, if you remember whether they were involved in that initial decision. Um, Ms. There was Mr. Quinn. Were any of the individuals listed in the handwritten document? Uh, there's Erskine, which I presume is Erskine Bowles. Was he consulted about the document? or? In no, these, are, yeah, these were internal notes of a particular staff member, so he was not consulted with regard to this document. This Ms. was somebody's notes. Mr. Bowles was not consulted. Correct. Do you know whose notes these were? It's my understanding that they're Brian Bailey's notes. Okay. And was Mr. Bailey consulted? Um, I don't know if he was consulted at that time or not. Okay. Uh, do you know Harold's listed? Was, uh, was Harold Dickey's consulted? I don't believe he would have been. These would have been Mr. Bailey's internal notes, so I don't believe we would have consulted him. But I'm doing my best to recall what, from over a year ago. I understand. Um, how about Deborah DeLee? Would she have been consulted? No. Okay. Or Bobby Watson? No. Okay. And then the other one I have to ask, uh, was, was the POTUS consultant, the no. president? No. Okay. Um, who is Brian Bailey again? Uh, Brian Bailey was at that time serving in, I believe, the deputy chief of staff's office. He was an assistant in that office. So he was the deputy to which deputy? I don't know that he which? was a deputy to a deputy. Um, okay. I actually don't know what his official title was. He was one of the staff members in the deputy chief of staff's yeah. office. And forgive me if I don't if I forget the organizational chart. Was Mr. Ickes and Mr. Bowles both of them were deputies? Did he work with one or the other? I believe both of them were deputies at the time that Mr. Bailey was working in the White House. I believe that's correct. I believe at that time he was working with Mr. Bowles, but that's my best understanding. Okay, thank you. Um, let me ask you this to to get the sequence correct. On that weekend when the documents were reviewed. Mr. Ruff indicated in his letter that they were then put in a folder. That was your job to put them in the folder and then keep custody of the documents? Actually, yes. At the end of what I was doing was I created a working file, a file of other materials that might need to be reviewed or, or issues that needed to be handled. And that file, when I was transferring the matter, that file was transferred. Okay. And 
who was the attorney to whom the documents were then transferred? Uh, Ms. Sally Paxton. Ms. Paxton. Did you review with her at that time the contents of the folder of documents that you had deemed were not relevant? I don't believe I reviewed the contents of the folder. I believe I might have reviewed my working file with her. In other words, the different files that were in my working file, but I don't believe, or at least I don't recall as I sit here right now, going through those documents with her. Okay. Um, Ms. Approximately when did you give Ms. Paxson the file? Um, I believe it would have been sometime in December. December. And of 1996, sir. And uh, again, you gave them to her because you were being reassigned to different duties? Or, or was that, what was the reason you gave them? Um, there were a lot of different matters that I was also starting to handle, and so we were transitioning different matters to different people. And this was one of the matters that Ms. Paxson had the fortune to be transferred to her. And, and we've enjoyed working with her, too, actually. Um, the, the, we're talking about the Hootie B matter generally, or, or all of the, just to be clear, the, the matter that was being transferred to her was the Hootie B investigation and the responses to our subcommittee? Correct. Okay. Um, let me ask you, Mr. Ruff, um, could you tell me, and, and I want to point everybody's attention to a letter that you wrote to me on May 20th, and it's tab nine in the book of documents about the, what, the Hootie B investigation. And for my colleagues, it's in the green folder, the May 22nd letter from Mr. Ruff to me. You indicate there, and, and we disagreed at the time, but mm -hmm. in fairness to you, you stated there is no evidence that in this memorandum or anywhere else that Hootie B was planned to be used for political purposes. Now, we now have new evidence that, that you tell me in your October 28th letter was newly, you became newly aware of. Mm -hmm. It strikes me that this new evidence, whether or not it's dispositive, is evidence that a discussion of an illegal activity using a government database to share information with the political campaign is now before us. Do you disagree with that? And, and I won't, don't want to hold you to the May 22nd I, I just, letter because uh, of the new Let me, I, first of all, I do uh, I disagree with your characterization. I would not now and hope never to hold myself out as an expert on the intricacies of, uh, of HUDB and all its many iterations. Uh, but uh, as I understand uh, the situation, there is a distinction, and I cannot tell what is reflected in this memorandum because I've not discussed it with anybody, between making databases compatible so that information can be used and making federally funded assets available for political purposes. Now, we may disagree about where on that spectrum this note or any other piece of evidence falls, but I know of nothing to suggest uh, a misuse of government assets for political purposes. I must say, Mr. Ruff, I, when, the, when the notion of sharing data comes up, that that is a, a non-governmental function of a government asset, and so a distinction that, that doesn't carry the difference. I, I am deeply concerned by this, and we'll want to continue to ask all of you about questions on custody of this document. But for now, let me yield back the balance of my time to the chairman. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. The chair will stand in recess. We have three votes on the floor on H.R. 188. Uh, we'll return just as quickly as possible. We will come to order. Uh, Mr. Waxman, your side is uh, recognized for 10 minutes. Who do you designate? Uh, Mr. Barrett. Thank you, Barrett. Mr. Waxman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman. Parents recognize for 10 minutes. Uh, I don't really have want to use a lot of time. I just have a couple of observations and then a couple of questions. One of the observations I had was earlier the chairman you referred to the number of uh, witnesses who had given been given subpoenas who have not been, not come forth to testify. Uh, and pointed out quite correctly that all those who have not testified um, are associated with the Democrats. And you said that. There was zero on the Republican side, which I assume is pretty accurate, given the fact that you 
haven't really asked any Republicans to testify. Uh, Mr. Chairman. I'd be happy to yield. I can't quite hear you. I don't know if it's the sound system. So I'm, I'll try there. Is that a little better? Well, I can hear you because I can hear your voice, but the sounds like the sound system. All right, I'll speak a little louder into the no, microphone, too. Uh, but I, I think it's, it's accurate to say that if no subpoenas are given to the Republican side, you are not going to have any Republicans that refuse to testify. You could turn that around and say that not a single Republican has agreed to come forth to testify, which would also be factually accurate. Um, so I think we have to sort of keep, keep uh, in perspective what we're doing here. Mr. Ruff, I have what's been labeled as Exhibit 64. Um, I don't know if you can grab that document. It's the handwritten note that we saw on the television screen here. Just that we were uh, discussing with Congressman McIntosh? Uh, no, I don't. I think, I think Mr. McIntosh did have that on the screen, yes. I don't, I don't know whose notes they are, but they're handwritten notes. But my question, and maybe you, not, you don't even have to look at it, All right. when you produced this document, was it, is it accurate to say that the White House produced this document? Uh, yes, if we are discussing the, uh, uh, the notes relating to Hootie B, uh, when we found the uh, document, uh, I guess it was last week, lost track of my weeks, uh, I sent it along with some others to uh, Chairman McIntosh, explaining the circumstances under which it had been discussed. Okay, so it was not something that was refused. It may have been late, it may not have come as quickly as they wanted, but, but this is something that was produced by the White House. That's correct. Uh, the subcommittee now has it, that's correct. And again, and this may be material that's uh, already been gone over here, but it would be helpful for me to date roughly how many documents have been produced by the White House? Um, I'm not sure I can break it into documents, but we're somewhere north of 110,000 pages of stuff. Uh, 110,000 pages of stuff. Gentlemen, this, this uh, PA system doesn't seem to be working. Mine does. No, this one not either. Uh, your, yours is breaking up too. Well, Mr. Chairman, this is your committee. Can you call the White House staff? And your television doesn't. Sound. Said it says some work. I think. <laughs> I think maybe we've got the stadium. Have we, have we called uh, uh, anybody over here to take a look at this? The VCR is now fixed. So now we can hear on the TV, but we can't hear each other. The, the oldest elevator technician is in. Call over and uh, get a technician over here as quickly as possible to find out what's wrong with the mics. Do you want me to proceed, Mr. Chairman, or should we wait? I think that we can figure out what you're saying, and if you want to proceed, we'd be I would more, I'd be more than happy to proceed. Thank you. I don't have a lot to, uh, again, again, 100, 110,000 pages have been produced. Do you have a feel for exactly how many pages we're fighting over that have not been produced or that mistakes were made on out of those 110,000? I'm not sure. I, I, can ask, I think it's fair to say, Congressman, uh, that with very few and very minor remaining exceptions, all of which the committee uh, staff is aware of. We are, in essence, in compliance with, uh, with the outstanding subpoenas. And of the 110,000 pages, how many mistakes were made? What percentage would you attribute it to mistakes? Well, of course, uh, there, there's no question that the videotape uh, issue is Loom's largest as our single biggest failure to find what we should have found. I think, uh, other than that, uh, what we have done is, by and large, to uh, have found bits and pieces from time to time that should have been found earlier, but the vast bulk of what has been produced has been produced in a regular, I believe, timely fashion. And from your perspective, has the videotape issue been pretty much resolved? I certainly hope it has, Congressman. I think the record is so clear at this point about the circumstances under which uh, it was first not found and then found. I hope there's very little dispute there. We're in the process even now of talking with uh, the committee about any other tapes they may be interested in looking at, but I certainly hope the general issue is close to being put to rest. Okay, thank you. The, the reason I raised 110,000 pages and, and the percentage of pages that were either erroneously or maliciously, if one wants to argue that, uh, mistaken, is because of the, the issue that was raised a little earlier that I think is an important issue to raise again, 
and that is the woman who lives in Congressman Moran's district who received the subpoena for her bank records. This is a woman, as this committee knows, who was applying for American citizenship. Her, her sin, apparently, according to this committee, is that she has an Asian American background, and for that reason, her bank records were subpoenaed. That was a mistake. The Republican Party recognizes it was a mistake. I think that they have apologized, rightly so. But I think as a percentage, and again, my understanding is the chairman mentioned that there were maybe 600 subpoenas issued, and there were two subpoenas that were erroneously issued, six, six subpoenas that were erroneously issued. That's a 1% error rate. If we're talking at 110,000 pages of documents that have produced, that have been produced, if we're looking at a 1% error rate, you've got about 1,100 pages that you can screw up before I think we're on, on equal ground with the Republicans in this. And again, I look at what happened to that woman, a woman who is waiting for American citizenship and has served with a subpoena to look at her phone records. And what is her reaction? If it were me, my reaction would be to freak out, wondering what in God's name have I done wrong? As it turns out, she was not from a politically active family. In fact, her husband's last contribution was in 1986 when he gave $50. I think he was a Republican at that time. Um, but she is not from a politically active family, but she is a victim. She is a victim of this investigation for the simple reason that she has an Asian American last name. And I think that if we're gonna point fingers, I think that we should be pointing them equally. And I think that there was a mistake that was made, and I will grant the, the majority party that there are gonna be mistakes made. But I think that there's a two-way street here. And it seems somewhat ironic to me that when the White House makes a mistake, and you have made a mistake, you should have produced those documents earlier, when there's a mistake made by the, by the Democratic administration, what do we do? We have two days of hearings. When there's a mistake made by the Republican side, oops. No further questions, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we, we have additional time. Do, do any other members on this side of the aisle? Yes. Mr. Patan. Thank you very much. Uh, one of the uh, allegations uh, that has been bandied about in terms of the uh, President's uh, efforts at fundraising in the last election was that he uh, hosted uh, supporters of his in the White House, um, and now, and which is the subject of the discussion about the videotapes. Now we know that he's not the only president that has done this. Um, in fact, we've seen at least uh, on videotape uh, President Reagan hosting them. The videotapes that were supplied by the White House, uh, there are other videotapes um, that the Senate Democrats wanted to receive uh, from the Bush Library and from the Reagan Library, and uh, neither wanted to comply. Um, as, as White House counsel, uh, could you tell me whether or not in the archives of the uh, White House Communications Agency uh, copies of those tapes would be available to this committee if we wanted to? request them. I, I don't believe so, but let me check with my... Uh, I believe that they are then transferred to the individual presidential libraries. We do have, I understand, but I have not seen it, nor has, has anyone else, I believe, in my office, uh, logs, computer records of what used to be in the archives, but I believe everything is now going to the individual presidential library. So the only way that this committee could get those is if we requested them some the form library. from those presidential libraries. I believe that's Which correct. are taxpayer-supported libraries? That's, that's correct. Okay. So, because it may be helpful to put this into some perspective, is that President Clinton is uh, among a, a, a number of presidents who have, as part of their uh, practice, hosted supporters in the White House in some form or fashion, financial supporters, and in some varying degrees, uh, thank them, encourage them in some way to uh, be uh, supportive of uh, the political party. So the president doesn't stand alone in fact. The other issue has been, principle been this focused foreign money. Uh, and both parties have received foreign money and had to return it. And the chairman mentioned earlier uh, of the emphasize that uh, there were grand jury investigation of certain activity uh, collected to put on the record. I want to I could also put it that Chairman Taylor Barber uh, 
assume it could be a secret jury, but in a similar manner, we testified by the Senate that he went to a foreign land and requested uh, and received over $2 million dollars foreign money, eventually helped the election of public Congress. Um, the, the circumstances around that uh, are very different than the circumstances around the uh, allegations of conduit payments in the Clinton campaign, and I want to, if I can draw that distinction um, for the record. One is that conduit payments are really kind of a fairly common um, violation of federal election law, hundreds of cases, which people who have uh, who seek to make contributions to someone else's campaign. It happened to members of Congress, it happened to the old campaign, uh, and seemingly it may have happened in the Clinton campaign. And all of those cases, to the best of my recollection, one exception having to do with a member of the Congress, um, it has been the, the uh, position of the Justice Department that either Bob Dole knew or any of these other parties knew that uh, the legal contracts were being made to their campaign. Uh, yes. Uh, the lights aren't working. We have the technician there. He's going to be one of the most popular fellows in the place. Uh, but your time has expired. We'll have to keep the time with a, a, a watch uh, for our next uh, round of questions. Uh, Cox. Thank you. We are sitting sufficiently close together that even if this doesn't work, I'm sure we'll be able to hear each other. Yes, sir. Uh, as you know uh, from our earlier meetings, uh, I used to work in the White House Counsel's Office. My job was Ms. Mills, roughly equivalent to yours, and I empathize with what you're going through. I understand that you produced 110,000 pages worth of documents. Because one of my colleagues from California earlier raised uh, the Iran-Contra example, uh, I would point to it as an example of what Congress typically does in an investigation of this sort and just uh, read briefly from the Iran-Contra report. At that time, the Democrats controlled the Congress. The chairman of the Senate committee was Daniel Inouye. The vice chairman was Roy Warren Rudman. We wish to recognize the cooperation that we received from the White House throughout this inquiry. Once our investigation commenced, the White House rose above partisan considerations in cooperating with our far-reaching requests and ensuring the cooperation of other agencies and departments of the executive branch. In compliance with our requests, over 250,000 documents were produced by the White House alone. I'd point out that's more than twice the number of documents we're talking about here in less than half the time. Additional large quantities of material were produced by other executive branch agencies and departments relevant personnel and officials, et cetera, were made available for interviews, depositions, discussions, and assistance in facilitating our work. All of our requests to the White House and the executive branch were fulfilled. The White House pledged to cooperate with this investi investigation, and it did. That's not a report that this committee is likely to issue because we've been meeting with you about compliance with subpoenas that have been outstanding for months. And the one that we're talking about here today, one of several that we're talking about here today, was issued on March 4th. Uh, it's my understanding that uh, the White House Counsel's Office uh, did not even contact uh, agencies within the White House uh, to return information about the subpoena uh, for some time after that. Uh, there was a March 24th return date on that subpoena, and a month after the return date on the subpoena had expired, on April 28th, uh, there was a memorandum sent to the Executive Office of the President covering these videotapes that uh, went to the military office and to WACA. My date correct? Was it April 28th that you sent that memo? That uh, directive was sent out on April 28th. It was not, however, the only step that was taken with respect to uh, the production of documents to this committee. Did you send a memo to WACA prior to April 28th, 1997? No. Thank you. Uh, about four months later, four months after you sent that memo to WACA on August 19, 1997, the United States Senate Committee on Government Affairs asked the White House, did WACA make any videotapes? It's a reasonably plain English letter, and it says, please advise immediately whether any video or audio record exists and whether it will be produced pursuant to the outstanding subpoena. 
uh, and the understanding expressed in the letter is that these videotapes were made by the White House Communications Agency, WACA, and that that information would be responsive to the subpoena. Uh, the letter is only one page long. Did you send a copy of that letter to WACA ever? No, but it wasn't necessary to do so, uh, Congressman Cox, because Mr. Ambrosio was already fully engaged in the process of dealing with Mr. Buckland's questions about right, Now, if you didn't send a copy of the letter, which asked for the videotapes, did you send your own memo to WACA asking for videotapes uh, in response of, to this letter of August 19th, 1997? First of all, uh, Congressman, I don't have the August 19th letter with me, but my recollection of the first paragraph is not uh, exactly as you have recited it. Second, I'm sorry, in what respect is your recollection we different? Them with a copy? I wonder if, if you Yes, let's, a, let's, uh, well, I'd be happy to have you read the first paragraph. Uh, spend the season. time for a moment while we get the witness a copy of this letter. It's very short. It's only three paragraphs. Yes. Uh, I have it now. And in what respect does your recollection of this letter differ from what we're discussing here? It doesn't. I just wanted to be clear that what uh, this paragraph says is, and it might be useful for me just to put it on the record so that we all have it. Uh, please don't read the, the letter. I've got a copy of it well, as well. I, I think it's important to understand what this letter is because it frames the question. You ask. Well, as you, as with all respect, I understand exactly what the letter is, uh, the request for videotapes from WACA, what it says it is. And my understanding is that you did not send a copy of this letter to WACA, neither did you send your own memo in plain English saying we have been contacted by the United States Senate. And they have said that their outstanding subpoena expressly includes WACA tapes, and we would like you to make those WACA tapes available to us. No such memo went, my understanding is, from the White House Counsel's Office to WACA at any date after August 19, 1997. Tell me if I'm wrong and there was such a memo, or whether you sent a copy. You are not wrong, but I believe your question slash statement is misleading. Because as the record very clearly reflects, Mr. Ambrosio, within, I believe, 10 days of this letter, was personally speaking with WACA about the very issues posed in the initial conversation with Mr. Buckland. And in this letter, as well as the broader request made in the April 28th directive. Well, you're so aware, the, I'm sure, that Walker's testimony is that they were not properly asked for this information. Why I would expect a lawyer's office to ask for documents in response to subpoenas, which are much more serious than simply document requests, with, in writing. When I worked in the White House Counsel's Office, that's the way it was done. I want to ask some additional questions. If I, if I, may, if I may, Congressman, because your, your question, I think, is once again not entirely an accurate reflection record. The WACA personnel did not testify that they were not properly asked. The testimony was, I believe, quite clearly that the directive of April 28th was sent from the White House military office to WACA, that one page, the critical page referring to coffee, in some fashion didn't make it through the fax machine or the, from the fax machine to the relevant people. They testified that it See. I'm sorry, uh, Counsel, but uh, I'm going to have to interrupt you because you're talking now about the original document request That's that correct. antedates by months the letter that we got from uh, the United States Senate in the White House. And what I've been able to establish in response to the questions I've just put to you is that I think I asked the question clearly. You responded in straightforward fashion. You neither sent a copy of the letter that the Senate sent to the White House expressly asking for WACA to turn over videotapes, nor did you restate that in your own language and in writing, there was simply no correspondence, no writing on this topic, requesting documents from the White House to Washington. Now, I want to ask you a different question. Do you remember this headline from the New York Times, which reads, Reno, in letter to Congress, it was page one, rejects most allegations that Clinton violated law. Do you remember the day that happened? It was a Saturday morning. Uh, I don't remember to give you a document, but I take your uh, word for the fact that it's in the New York Times. Do you remember that uh, it was front page news and newspapers across America when Janet Pino uh, issued the letter on Friday, October 3rd? I sure did. And uh, were you surprised that that was front page news and newspapers across America? No, I wasn't surprised. Why weren't you surprised? Because I would think that any time the Attorney General speaks to issues, particularly in the form of a response to the chairman of 
the House Judiciary Committee that bear on her assessment of violations of law by senior officials, that that would be fine. And then another reason that you're not surprised is that she advanced that by October 3rd was the date that she would do to make that decision to respond to Henry Hyde's letter to us. Indeed, I From us to you, Mr. Tech. Indeed, I did. And that was a deadline that was pretty well known around the country. Absolutely. Uh, and because the question was, will there be an independent counsel uh, investigation taken one step further with respect to the president, the vice president? That's a pretty serious pattern. Now, that was October 3rd. The chief says, do that. Uh, you met with the attorney general the day before, didn't you? That's correct. Uh, and you met with her about 3 in the afternoon? That's correct. Uh, did you do something unusual that morning before you met with her? Congressman, uh, no, actually, I didn't. Uh, Did but if, but if you're, you if you're, videotapes of the president uh, at the White House copies that morning. If, if your question is, was I aware of the videotapes earlier that day? It was either late morning or early afternoon. That's not the question. The question is, did you look at those videotapes? I, I did. I so testified. I so stated publicly. All right. Now that's not unusual. Of course, it's unusual. Well, all right. I'm trying to be as responsive to your question as Yes, and that's why I asked you whether it was an unusual morning. Because believe me, when I worked at the White House Counsel's Office, if we were in the middle of an investigation of this magnitude, and particularly you knowing uh, what meaning tapes have in an investigation like this because of the water damage, um, I'm sure we're sitting on a bombshell. You understood that. But that also made national news. You stated earlier in your testimony here today that this has taken on a life of its own and it's occupied the media's attention for a month. But you uh, knew this, and the rest of the world didn't know it that morning. Uh, and in fact, how long did it take you to watch it? Perhaps five minutes. Less than five minutes. Um, and, uh, what's the name of the member of the council's office that first informed you about it that morning? Mr. Ambrosio. And uh, how long did you talk to Mr. Ambrosio about this case? He came in, said that he had found evidence in the computer database that these tapes existed. That he how had, long did he take? I, I'm just trying to give you a sense of it showed me, uh, told me that he had a sample of them, I believe there were three, perhaps four, showed them to me, and I told him to take whatever steps were necessary. Did you talk to anybody about it uh, on the phone that day before you met with the Attorney General? No, I didn't. Did you talk to the President about it that day? No, I didn't. Um, did you talk to the Chief of Staff at the White House about it? No, I didn't. Did you talk to Mike McCurry about it? No. So you kind of kept it to yourself? Uh, other than my conversation with Mr. President. And then you met with the Attorney General later that day. When you met with her, were you aware that the Justice Department had an outstanding request for those three documents? I think it's fair to say I was aware, so testimony. And you were also aware that the next day was the day that she was going to make national news. One way or the other, you weren't sure which way uh, on the question of whether an independent counsel should look into these things. Indeed, I've stated publicly. Mr. Chairman, my time expired. Uh, I think the gentleman had In all fairness, it seems to me we ought to make sure this high-tech system works really works. If you like, uh, set the example of the White House. If, if, if you like, uh, I hate to inconvenience uh, the witnesses, but what we could do is uh, recess until tomorrow morning at 10. Mr. Chair. Well, the thing is, uh, this is important for the American people as well, and the television stations uh, that are here can't pick this up because of the, of the annoying interference. So uh, since we can't get this fixed, I don't think it would be of long duration tomorrow, but would it be possible for you to come back so we can move this in a short period of time tomorrow? Uh, of course we're at the committee's disposal, Mr. Chairman. I think that, that what we'll do is just recess until 10 in the morning and then I'll make sure that this place is fixed. Thank you very much. Please stand for recess until 10 tomorrow morning.